So, um, welcome everybody to the 12 to 1400 so, group lesson. So, um, welcome everybody to the 12 All right. <laughs> I know people in the group probably tend to have the stream on, but it sounds like, sounds like we're clear of echoes now. Um, all right. So, um, last week we, uh, started an assessment on your tactics. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about how to improve them based on where you are. But before I can do that, um, we're going to need to, uh, do one last thing. So I'm going to need to see what you thought of the position I sent you, um, to look at this week. Um, so I've got it set up. This is a black to play position. I'll flip it around, I guess. Can't believe I've conceded to flipping things. Um, I'll flip it around so black's at the bottom of the screen. Um, and this position here, it was black to play. Um, anyone have some variations written down that they want to read for me? I have a bunch that I found don't work. And my conclusion was ultimately that there's nothing crazy here. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, so I spent about, I think you recommended five to 10 minutes. I spent about eight minutes. Perfect. And so my thought, I was typing as I was thinking, and I said, the only capture I see is knight takes e4. After d takes e4, queen takes h4. Uh, but the queen will be in a weird, or d, d takes e4, queen takes h4, but the queen will be in a weird spot. Um, white, lose, white loses a central pawn, but I think black is pretty cool here. White um, but I was, I, I was like, it can't be that easy. So then I thought knight takes e4, knight takes e4, and then queen h4, bishop f7, king f7. Uh, and then kind of thinking of the bishop f7, you know, I was just kind of thinking, what, you know, what is, does white have any forcing moves? Right. So then I thought about, you know, what if white has a different move order? So I thought, I then went to knight takes e4, bishop f7 from white right, right after knight e4. Mm -hmm. King f7, queen h5 check, king g8, and then uh, white can take the e f take the knight on e4 however he wants and probably have a pretty sweet position, I think. Um, so the whole point of that was to defend your knight on h4. Right. Super. And then I saw uh, knight takes e4. Uh, let's see. Then I saw that there was actually a knight takes e4 and then queen h5 right away because you're threatening uh, queen f7, queen g8 mate, and you're also defending the knight on g4, and the knight on e4 is, I mean, the knight on uh, h4, and then the, the knight on e4 is just hanging. So you're threatening mate, and the e4 knight is just hanging while, you know, mate's hanging as well. And after spending a lot of time, you know, proving myself that knight takes e4 was definitely bad for black, <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, all right, there's, that's like the only capture there's nothing particularly forcing other than b4 and after and b4 is a tempting move but uh you know a takes b4 and i takes b4 and black my assessment is black has just opened white's you know a just activated white's a run rook sure you're threatening to take you know the bishop but like i feel like white's even happy to just play bishop b3 and now his rook is doing something so i was i was thinking black doesn't have any like crazy tactics he just needs to play a positional move Right. Something slow here. Yeah, the rook definitely thanks black for that move before. Um, anything else? Um, uh, I'm. I mean, sorry. When you picked a positional move, what move did you pick? Or. Um, I I still thought that b4 might do something just because it creates kind of an imbalance in the position. So I, I didn't hate b4. I just thought that b4 was. It's like if if you want to do something. You can play before and you 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 know you kind of have an imbalanced position mm -hmm. uh, otherwise i was thinking like queen d7 i mean mm -hmm. i was kind of stuck i was like yeah i was thinking like queen d7 i was thinking i was if i had more time i would have calculated d5 a bit but okay at my first glance i was thinking d5 we're just trading a, opening up the center a bunch and mm -hmm. not really getting much for it right so yeah, i had d5 and queen d7 just to my just my branch of variations here yeah. as sort of one move ideas. So like, so yeah. like for me, if I, like if I had this at a blitz game, you know, if, if I were a blitz game, I would have played queen D seven or B four. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. A nice thing about queen d7 is it covers a weak point on f7, and it's just kind of an organizing move. b4 trying to do something basically is good for... I mean, it helps white more than black. Um, there's some other do-nothing moves you could consider. I mean, they're not do-nothing moves, but there's some other positional moves you could consider. Um, but we can talk about that later. Um, anyone else want to go next? Uh, Give me. One of the ones, uh, Elfins mentioned, and I guess one of the ones I was looking at, I don't know if you mentioned it or not, but I was looking at Bishop, uh, Bishop C8. Mm -hmm. um, the idea there, it's going to help strengthen uh, your G5. Uh, you know, the control, control attack from G5 with your knight or your, or your bishop. But also, if you want to, you're going to have the resource to potentially trade off that light squared bishop of white, which is pretty powerful in uh, attacking your uh, F7 pun. Mm-hmm. That was the positional play I was looking at. Was um, you know, I saw some of the night moves. I was calculating um, <clears throat> some of the uh, white's uh, sacrifices on uh, h6 with the bishop. I didn't see too much change today, so I, uh, I gave that up for a while to see how much trouble we might be in if they, uh, if they um, you know, if they sack the bishop. So yeah, that the last uh, I guess the last one I looked up was that bishop uh, bishop c8. Mm -hmm. So you didn't find any like proactive tactic you wanted to play for black here? I, I was looking at that uh, knight take, uh, knight take me forward. Well, I looked at that, and uh, um, I, I think the first variation I saw there was what if, uh, what if I just ignored the straight up ring between immediately to uh, h5, which I think Elfin's covered, but that was what I thought was uh, could happen. Mm -hmm. um, there is a potential even for to stop at g4, g4, h5. G4 or H5? Uh, yeah. Um, but they did, they got to they, they take your knight, so you no longer get the tactic of uh, picking up the knight in the pawn. Mm -hmm. um, you probably have to bring your knight back in this variation, is what I was thinking. Knight, knight back to uh, F6. Mm -hmm. um, and it was pretty comfortable for, for white. They uh, have all the pieces on the king side, You're, uh, and you don't. Um, right. Would you take on f7 with the queen or the bishop? So I did see that actually. And, um, let's see if I put it in my notes. Um, no, I didn't, I didn't put the variation in the notes. I didn't write down what I would take, but I guess I would uh, probably take with the bishop and fork the, uh, fork the rook. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, Thierry or or just or JB, did either of you um, look at knight takes e4? Mm -hmm. I did. Uh, I saw knight takes e4, and then was looking at either um, d takes e4 or knight takes e4, and how that would allow uh, the queen to take the knight mm -hmm. but i didn't quite look at uh, possible counterplay for white basically i was i was trying to be more about the breadth of variations and and options rather than like deep mm -hmm. so i didn't go quite as deep as some of what uh Alphons and zenth have outlined mm -hmm. um and even then even in looking mostly at like um Looking mostly at um, the wide variety of options, I didn't actually get into that many. Uh, I was looking at, you know, what's already been mentioned before, and I take C4. Uh, I was trying to find a way to somehow push D5, D4, mm -hmm. um, but I, I, because of how the pieces currently are for white, but I, I didn't find anything that could really support that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I did get a bit stuck with this position, actually. This is, again, you know, the type of position that is quite challenging for me in terms of finding a, a move. So yeah. that's sort of where I am. Okay. So I'm curious. Um, after knight takes e4, and let's say um, d takes e4, mm -hmm. did you think that this position was good for black or not? Uh, well, so queen takes knight, and I think that's pretty comfortable for black yeah okay 
um, if uh, and if knight takes e4, knight takes e4, were you also comfortable taking the knight on h4? I did take the knight on h4, but didn't quite think about like the greater position because again, like I don't think I looked much further. Yeah. Um, I mean, at I this think... point, at this point, in a certain sense, this is where a tactical variation is supposed to stop. Like there aren't any more captures for white or black, so that's where you're supposed to stop and sort of decide if you would want to play this or not. Mm -hmm. Right. So you've traded a knight for a knight and pawn, and then you're supposed to look at it and say. Do I want to win this pawn or not? And and then that the variation is supposed to stop at that point. If you keep calculating on and on, it's just too much work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know if it's a valid way to think about it or not, but I do tend to also look at the way you gain space or gain material or gain an advantage differently if you're black or white and so for example and i remember doing this with uh, zenth actually where uh, no sorry with elfins where we're looking at opening moves and deciding when you had an advantage or not and i tend to see advantages a lot more for black because it seems like even if you gain a little bit it's already like a greater win than if you win a little bit as white because you sort of start with a quote-unquote advantage as white and abilities to do a bit more of what you want to do and so if you manage to equalize or gain some kind of advantage for black like i see that as more of a victory i guess and so and, and again i don't know if that's the right way to think about it but uh, i do tend to see that way so here for black you know you end up winning a pawn and i would be quite happy about that mm -hmm. cool um was there any reason then for you not to play knight takes e4 as black here like in your um, calculations so far, you told me pawn takes e4, knight takes e4. Both of them leave you with an extra pawn and comfortable. I didn't calculate, I didn't look into what happens if white doesn't take, which I think, okay. uh, you know, has been explained as to why that would be bad for black, actually. Right. So if I had looked at that, indeed, uh, I think knight takes e4 doesn't look so good, but if I'm just looking at the variations I identify, I would find it good and probably then get surprised when they don't take back, right? Or something right. like that. But your calculations showed that you could take the pawn on e4? Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm going to move on to Thierry. Yeah. Uh, so, honestly, I didn't find my take c4 in my first 10 minutes. I came back to the exercise later and I found it and I calculated, but at first I missed it for some reason. I just, uh, I think I didn't consider it because the E4 was defended for some reason. So I tried different things and they were all not satisfactory, like Knight uh, H7, wondering if the Knight would be better getting to like uh, g5 with tempo mm -hmm. because the this knight is undefended so you gain a tempo on it mm -hmm. and that didn't seem special I, it, I didn't find something concrete there but I thought the white just brings the knight back or even they can push it further to uh, f5 yeah. towards me so it's not I didn't find something special there. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if any of you could guess this, but when you're looking at this position, basically the last move was knight f3 to h4. Right? Mm. That's why the knight's now on this undefended square. You know, you won't normally see a piece just sort of dangling like that on a square like h4 for like seven moves long, right? Like no, nobody really wants their knight on h4 that much. It's it's a way to maneuver the knight to a really good square on f5, typically, in this pawn structure. And very often, if you want to play knight h4 as white, you have to check whether black has any tricky moves with the knight before you play knight h4. Mm. Right? Because if you imagine this with the knight on f3, you say, well, my knight on f3 is blocking f2 to f4. It also, 
you know, is successfully defended by the e5 and d6 pawns as far as black structure. The h6 pawn is covering g5. So once black's played d6 and h6, your knight on f3 has a real incentive to move, maybe somewhere even better. And if you can get to f5, that's a very, very strong square. So you'll often see people try knight h4, and then they have to calculate these knight takes e4 moves. It's a very common calculation to have to make. Okay, so um, so knight h7, you had the idea. That's a fine idea. And then white might bring the knight forward, and you might bring your knight forward. Yep. Okay. Um, the main line I calculated when I got to knight e4 was knight e4, queen f3. Mm -hmm. Because it threatens mate um, from f... Like, if the queen gets to f7, it's mate. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, and if the knight goes back to like g5, um, the back knight uh, to just defend itself and try to defend this, it can be taken by the, the bishop and then mate is again threatened. So it's no good. So you have to go back directly to f3, I think. Yeah. With the knight to defend. Mm hmm. Yeah, you're right for sure about that. Um, I calculated some variations there, but um, I didn't save my PGM properly. <laughs> so okay. I don't remember them, honestly. I thought I couldn't figure out a way to for sure guarantee that I could take you for with the knight. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at this, and it was kind of complicated, but you weren't sure whether or not black should or shouldn't go for this. Yeah, in many lines, uh, you just get mated. So I, I, some of them I didn't find a, a proper defense. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So I will, um, I will tell you all uh, the answer now since you've already worked on this position. Um, knight takes e4 fails, and it fails to several. Um, It fails to a couple different things. Queen h5 is better than queen f3 because it doesn't allow knight f6. So queen h5 is very, very clear that black's in big trouble, right? Their knight's hanging, f7's hanging. There's just, there's not any particularly interesting move for black to play next. I mean, you should calculate knight g5 just like Thierry did with the queen on f3 would be a plausible move to calculate defending f7 and once you find bishop takes g5 for white you can kind of leave that move behind um so in this position here knight takes e4 doesn't work and um that may lead us to trying to play some kind of positional move if we want to play a positional move i think the most logical move is one which I believe Xanth was telling us bishop to c8 um, with the idea of maybe putting the bishop on e6 to block the bishop on a2. Also, you're fighting for control of f5 if the knight tries to outpost there, which you know it's trying to do. And also he said in some case he could play bishop or knight to g4, although white might play h3 here. So that's like the cleanest looking positional move. Um, there is... A genius move hidden in this position. <laughs> um, I guess by genius move, I mean like, uh, yeah, I mean, like a move that I would have a really hard time finding. So it's just, I mean, anytime somebody says something like that's great or that's terrible, it's basically relative to them, right? So to me, this move is genius. Um, to some grandmaster who spent their whole life playing the Italian game and the Rui Lopez, it might not be a surprise. They might see it in one second. And to somebody rated 1,000, they might not understand it even after you show it to them, and or they might spend three years trying to find it and not find it. But the genius move for black here, from my perspective, is the move d5. So although all the knight takes e4s don't work, we can play d5, threatening d4. We completely don't have control over d5, right? but we use the undefended knight on h4 to make an impossible trade. We just recapture on d5. And this totally fixes black's opening. 
or we're going from the opening to the middle game, right? This move here just gives black a great game. I see. Yeah, I was looking at d45, but looking at the fork there, but it's interesting that that's how it works out. Yeah, white can take with the knight that's or the tough. bishop, and black will take back on h4, and it's just a trade, but black has solved all their problems. And um, if white instead moves the knight to f5 or something, black can trade this knight on e3 or c3 or just play some other move like knight from c6 to e7 or somewhere, right? There's, there's options for black. But basically here we can see that white has no way to, to win material. So we get away with d5. Yeah, I saw the idea, like, but I just thought that all of white's pieces are converging quite nicely in the center. And even though I'm going to, you know, get the knight on h4, I wasn't really comfortable with, like, my queen being off sides in my piece. I felt like my, you know, black's piece coordination wasn't good enough. Like, I didn't have time to think, you know, to think about the options or really evaluate this, I guess, properly. Right. Yeah, it's not an easy position to evaluate. Um, if you saw that it was possible to play d5 and not lose material that's pretty amazing so you can feel very happy about that all right so um like i, I assume that white was going to kill me with a tactic after i take the night like genuinely <laughs> yeah Okay, so let's talk about um, let's talk about how to improve your calculations from where you're at right now for all four of you. Um, so I'm gonna mess up my my thing in order to in order to share screen with you. Okay, share screen. My live chess. Okay, this thing's gonna be weird for a second. Um, do, do, do. I'm like, okay, clean up the big group picture. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now you can see my situation here. I'm going to go to puzzles. Puzzles. Fix another screen capture. Apologies. Okay, um, looks like I need to re-log in too. Okay. Okay, so um, for three out of the four of you, what I'm gonna show next is the main thing that you want to be doing. Okay, so Xanth, Thierry, and JB. This is for you, what we're gonna do next here. So um, you can do normal puzzles. Wait, hang on. I have to do custom puzzles. <laughs> You're gonna do custom puzzles. Um, and I don't know exactly how inflated the puzzle ratings are right now. Do you wanna just tell me what your, what your puzzle ratings are if you have puzzle ratings? We're at 2,000 right now. You're at what? 2,000. 2,000? Okay. Yeah, I'm at 2,000 as well. Mine's 2,300. <laughs> and Thierry? I don't do puzzles. On you don't do puzzles. Um, okay. All right. Well, we're going to guess you're 2,000 then. 
Um, so <laughs> the, your puzzle range that we're gonna do, but we're gonna be going for very, very high accuracy, okay? We're gonna be going for very high accuracy. So we'll start out with a range like 1800 to 2000, okay? We can leave all themes in for now, okay? We're just putting a range I'm using a range because if I just do puzzles, it's going to show it to me. If you do puzzles just normally, it'll probably give you about this range, right? I think um, you had some themes selected, though. Yeah. I do have some themes selected? Okay. Yeah, you have yeah. a set of promotion puzzles. I'll go back and fix that. My screen capture got messed up again somehow. Okay. All right. So let's go back then. Promotion. Yeah. Okay. So themes, all themes. Okay, so here's what, what you're gonna wanna do. Um, you're going to want to do these puzzles for accuracy with writing down the variations and a time limit. Okay, so you're trying to be very thorough and double check, but I also want a time limit on it. Um, so, you're going to give yourselves five minutes just as a standard. If you solve a puzzle faster than that, that's okay. You don't have to keep double checking and double checking and triple checking, etc. You know, I would say a single double check is probably fine. It's probably a good habit. Um, because the way you approach this, we want to be something that can carry over to how you work during your games. Um, in your games, I think probably double checking is about the right amount of checking. I think never, I think only looking at something once probably risks too many errors and continually checking more than twice is going to be pretty bad <laughs> for your clock situations. So you probably typically want to be somewhere around a double check. All right. So you give yourself um, five minutes and uh, you can write down your variations. And Are we looking to solve this one? What's that? Are we looking to solve this one on the screen? Uh, we will in a moment, yeah. But right okay. now I'm just telling okay. you what your approach will be when you're doing this. That, that's, that's what I thought, own, yeah. but just <laughs> <Yeah>. checking. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So you'll want to, uh, you'll want to write down your variations so that you can check against yourself because the way the chess.com puzzle is going to work is you're going to insert when you're going to enter some move it'll tell you you're wrong or you're right if your move is right it'll play one branch but there might be two or three different moves you were checking against right like if in this position your move that you're looking at is queen f8 you need to calculate the rook on d8 takes your queen and the rook on h8 takes your queen right both of those should be on your piece of paper. Um, and the chess.com thing is only going to show you one. So on so when you're done solving the puzzle, you have to double check your other variations that you've written down. That makes sense? So you can do that by playing out the moves, or I think on most of the chess.com puzzles, you can click on a thing to see sort of like the source analysis or whatever of the of the puzzle and click through extra variations like that. Um, Thierry, you're probably not used to doing that, so I'll I'll show you that while we're here today. Um, but hopefully the idea makes sense, right? You play through like branches and double check your variations um, by actually moving. Um, okay, uh, what else do I wanna say about this? Okay, so basically here's the thing. Um, you guys seem to be able to visualize pretty fine on um, was my was my assessment you're able to look at least three moves deep without the position getting muddled or confusing for you um all of you are able to do that and that would definitely be like a reasonable benchmark for your for your rating range and i've seen that sometimes you can look even even further than that. So I think your visualization and looking ahead is pretty good. Um, 
There are some positions in which you calculate slowly. That's one reason I've put a time limit on this. Um, and I also think that you're not very thorough about generating candidate moves for maybe like the defending side or sometimes even for yourselves. So like JB was saying on this puzzle that, that, that you all did as homework, she was focusing on breadth instead of depth because she'd already identified that from my comments last week, right? Was that, okay, you guys were doing a good job of looking far ahead, but what's the point of that if you're missing an option on the first move, right? And that's something that I've been working on myself, um, you know, is trying to like really see the options on move two for myself instead of going ahead to move 10 and one or two variations. Um, so, so yeah, so I think, I think, I think a thoroughness of seeing like lots of possible moves is important. And I should say that with where you are, this does not replace the style of puzzle doing described in the new video, right? Where you're trying to acquire a couple new patterns per day by going quickly. Um, so I do think that you also still have new patterns to learn. So I'm not saying you're done with exercise number one. We're just supplementing it with this exercise as well. Does that make sense? So you could still profit from 10 to 15 minutes a day of sort of blitzing through things where if you don't see it in 30 seconds, you look at the answer, repeat it three times in your head, and then go on to the next one, try and get three new patterns like that because I think part of your struggle with finding all the candidate moves is that there are patterns that you aren't that you aren't familiar with in the position I had just given you um here with like knight takes e4 I think some of you hadn't just noticed that the knight on h4 could go to g6 just from the way you were talking about the position I think you all expected the knight to maybe go to f5 or something and hadn't noticed that knight g6 was like a likely move for white as well. Um, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, nobody suggested playing g6 to keep it out of f5 at least, which would have been a really bad move because of knight takes g6. Um, so maybe maybe you guys saw it, but I had the feeling like you don't just like glance at this position and be like, oh, the knight might be going to g6. Um, I don't think that you have that kind of like instant board vision of some of the of some of the themes. And if you don't just see that the knight can go to g6, it's more of a struggle for you to come up with like thorough candidate moves on moves one and two, right? So I think that that can be worked on in a couple ways, but one of the main ways is just continuing the basic building blocks, right? With the, with the short tactics, okay? Um, okay, so going to these puzzles, so here it's going to be about finding candidate moves for yourselves and good candidate moves for the opponent, right? So I'd like your first move to be pretty thorough for yourself and for their possible responses, right? Like if you wanted to go queen f8 here, okay, you got to look at both rooks taking the queen, right? But maybe there's one other move you also have to look at. Like if the queen on f8 is trying to take the pawn on f6, let's say, you consider taking the sacrifice, but you also consider is there some other move black could play to defend the f6 pawn, right? So if you can be really if you can be really thorough on the first moves for yourself and the opponent, I think that will already be like a good step to be getting to. But again, I want you to try and push yourselves to do that first move assessment pretty quickly, right? These puzzles that you're doing are still going to be like three moves long, probably in general. Um, which is a normal range for you. So you're just trying to be thorough about seeing the possible defenses for the opponent. Unfortunately, in contrast to puzzles I might give you, these puzzles always have an answer. So when you find some like exciting looking move, it's usually going to be right. So you'll be, so you'll seem to be like rewarded for, for not checking thoroughly for your opponent's defenses, right? Um, and as I love to do, I gave you guys a puzzle just now where knight takes e4 didn't work. And the puzzle was to not play it. <laughs> um, to not play the only interesting capture in the position. So 
Um, these you'll know that there's that when you find like the right move, you'll basically know that it's the right move just because it's in a puzzle, right? But that's why I want you to really look at did you thoroughly list like the defensive moves for the opponent? Because you can check that on yourself after you're done with the puzzle. And uh, I mean, when you see people do puzzle rush, right? If puzzle rush included positions where there isn't a tactic and you had to click a button that says no tactic, right? Imagine if just 10% of the positions didn't have a tactic and you had to click no tactic. People would just be smashing like every move that looks violent, right? Like, oh, it's queen near their king. Oh, it's like, you know, try and make a fork, you know? And it'd be like, eh. the square was defended, you know, there's nothing here. So... Um, so I, I mean, it's, it's like a huge factor. And so you guys are going to have to really like police yourselves on, did you, did you really look for possible defenses for the opponent? Because in your games, you know, three quarters of the time you get inspired by a move like queen F8, there'll be a refutation <laughs> it, and it, it just won't work every time. All right. That said, you are getting a chance to win almost every game you play tactically. Your opponents are allowing a winning tactic every single game. You just don't always notice it. So there, there are some chances there, but they're not always there. Okay, so um, let's do this together for like a couple reps just to um, see how it works and see how to go over it as well. Okay. Elf, you can obviously go along with us, even though I'm going to give you something else to work on too. All right, so um, five minutes starting now. White to play. Are we noting it down or saying oh, some yeah. idea that loud? Write it down. See, I feel like the way I think about chess just gives me cheat codes with puzzles. <laughs> and I, I remember uh, when we were doing puzzles together, Athens, and you kind of gave me also the like cheat code to puzzle, which is just like look for the move that limits the option of the opposite side, right? And so I think that speaks to what you were saying, David, too, that for these puzzles, it's a it's different than looking at a position where there is no right answer because you know here that there is something that you need to look for, right? So, yeah. But also, I think ninety percent of my chess training has been puzzle rush, so that's why I think about it. <laughs> like that's why you see chess that way too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Dave, Yukai, and Bomb. Um, you're welcome to say the move in chat. People who don't want to see the answers won't be won't be reading chat, and certainly the the group of students will not be reading chat while they're doing this.
You've got about 30 seconds left. All right. Uh, Xanth, want to read me your paper? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, queen, uh, queen e5 check as the first variation. Mm -hmm. um, king take queen, uh, then bishop c5 mate. Mm -hmm. um, found that. Um, Probably uh, my first little variation to go through. Um, then I kept looking for see if there's anything better. Um, so I looked at uh, queen takes c5. Um, no, queen c5 check. Sorry, queen c5 check. But then that's all. Queen takes queen. Bishop takes, takes queen. King takes bishop. Um, didn't see anything special there. Then I looked at uh, queen takes c5 check. Uh, queen takes queen. Rook takes queen. King takes rook. And then the last variation I was looking at was um, queen d4, actually. Uh, queen d4 check. And king's only move was uh, c d7. Um, or you could block with the queen, uh, the dark, or the, the black queen, but uh, that leaves it hanging with the bishop on a3. And so if the king goes to c7, I saw uh, queen takes uh, f6. Mm -hmm. And that was, that, was, that was my, I guess, the four paths so. I'd look at in the five minutes. Yeah, that might be an even better way to win the pawn in f6 than my queen f8 suggestion. Um, so, um, so at, it, once, so if you look at queen a5 and black has no legal move other than taking it because you've got those squares covered, and then you play here and you think it's checkmate, you don't need to look for extra moves for white once you've found something that good. Okay, so once you find something that looks that good for you, all you need to do is just double check any other move black has. So you just check, like, is there any other legal move here other than king takes queen? If not, you play it in your head, then you go, okay, I play bishop c5. Is there any, like, move, right? Like, and you can just be thorough about that, but you don't need to keep looking for variations beyond this one. Okay. I'm going to okay. up on king takes queen. I had to fight the instinct. Just like, oh, that doesn't work and trap that whole thing. Like right. Hangs the queen, so I was like, oh, wait, wait, wait. And then, of course, I saw the. Uh, I'll yeah. Wait. Right. Right here, you really need to, like. I mean, first of all, someone has to have the idea to even look at queen a5. And then you need to really look at, you know, all the bishop moves to find the one that, that gets the king. All right. Next puzzle. Five minutes. Black's move.
Anyone need the last minute? Yes. Okay, um, Thierry, you want to read me your paper, please? Yeah, um, well, the best variation for me was rook d to d1. And afterwards, I looked at various moves, but I think they all lead to um, either rook g to e1 mate or rip d to e1 mate okay um want to read us your list of moves for white after you play rook d to d1 yeah c8 promotes to queen mm -hmm. um i tried rook as c1 rook h1 good um those were the three important ones. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on your paper? <laughs> I tried B3 at first, but uh, it's just A takes B. <laughs> okay. But after after this rook D to um to D1 move, you have C8 for white, rook C1, rook H1. Is there any other move for white? No, I missed it if there's something else that like okay. can add tries to delay mate but they all don't work okay yeah yeah none of none of them work i'm just wondering how many moves you looked at for for white there yeah um yeah but those were the ones that i thought maybe had a chance but i turned turned out they don't so yeah you can cool. promote with the other rook another move would be uh, rook to d2 trying to give the king a flight square through d3 <laughs> I missed it. Yeah, it's fine. I kind of looked at it, but I missed it. Yeah. Okay. So he's got the right answer. Uh, rook here. And then this move here stops checkmate for the moment, but you take the rook, right? And then here. All right. Now, um, let me see if I can show you how to check... This, That's thing. The this, this button glass. here, probably this one here. So if we click on this, Thierry, it'll open up a board like this for you. And then using this board, you can double check whatever moves you had written down, right? So now if you wanted to, you could try like B3 and see what the what what happens in that position here <laughs> by playing out some moves, right? White makes a queen. Take a rook, threatening rook d2 check. White gives some checks with the queen, right? Or you could go back, play rook dd1, and then, you know, here you could double check, like rook c1, was I right that I could checkmate this way? Yes, right? Um, rook h1, was I right that I was planning to take the rook? Yes. Um, uh, you had queening as well, and you can just play out this and make sure that it really was checkmate, right? So whatever moves you have, you can go through them there. 
So after you so after you do a puzzle, that little button there, that's where you can check and play out any variations you wrote down that don't come up in the solution, which will always only be one variation. Okay. Um, All right, give me one second to remember the next thing. Okay, um, Elfin, so what I want you to do is a pretty um, weird thing that I've never had anybody else do. Um, so your calculations are already very good when you know it's a puzzle, right? When you know it's a puzzle, when you're the one who has like a tactic available to you, your calculations very, very clear and thorough. When you're playing a game, you won't necessarily recognize when your opponent has tactics available against you, right? And that's, that's currently like the weakness in within your calculations or tactics, right? Is recognizing opportunities for the opponent. Um, so what I want you to do is to take some tactical positions and taking positions from this tactics trainer is not going to work very well for you unfortunately <laughs> you're too sort of like spent zoned into that on it. <laughs> what's that i spent too many hours on it you spent too many hours in there already and you're too like zoned in to way that to the way that works right so what we need for you um are positions that aren't from the tactics trainer that may or may not have a tactical puzzle in them right so you're going to take like a grandmaster game that didn't end in a draw and you start playing through the game and asking yourself are there any tactics yet are there any tactics yet are there any tactics yet okay um you're not spending like minutes per move right you're just you're just kind of playing through it pretty quickly maybe 10 seconds per move is there a tactic here if you think no, you keep going. Okay. Um, when you start to feel like there might be a tactic, you will stop and give yourself some time to really look at the position. Okay. So if we want to grab like an example game. Um, here's a game that was played the other day. Not quite Grandmaster game, but pretty close, right? So this game here, you're just kind of playing through it. Like, do I think there's a tactic yet? Eh, probably probably not. Do I think there's a tactic yet? Mm, queen c4, king h8, probably not. Right, so you just sort of play through it, asking yourself if there's a tactic, if there's a tactic. Is there a tactic? Maybe, right? If you even reach maybe, then you can stop and try to calculate, okay? So what might arouse our maybe here and I don't know how good you are at, at figuring out when there's plausibly going to be a tactic. I think it's going to be a good exercise for you because I think that's something where you could get better. But here, the reason I would say maybe is this is undefended. This has one-to-one. -one, so it one more attacker attacks it, right? And this has one-to-one. -one. So White's got three things on the same rank that are either undefended or barely defended. So that calls for calculation, right? And so you'll stop here and you'll say, okay, I'm, I'm black to play and I'm checking if there's a tactical opportunity for black. Compared to tactics trainer, you don't know if there is an option for black or not. But that's not even the end of it. What I want you to do is to practice flipping sides in your head between white and black. Okay, so look at it for a bit from black side, like do I have a tactic, do I have a tactic? And then flip 
in your head and now you're white and you're like, does my opponent have a tactic? Does my opponent have a tactic? Okay, and I want you to flip back and forth twice. Mm -hmm. So you can spend like two minutes for black, two minutes for white, two minutes for black, two minutes for white, approximately. I don't like need you like- Like in the same position? Like in the same position? On this like exact position, yeah. And then, and, assume it's all, and then it's also try like the same position with black to move? Yeah. So, well actually it's always black to move. So as okay. white, you're sitting there waiting for your opponent to move and you're like, shoot, do they have a tactic? Do they have a tactic? Right? And then you switch to black and you're like, okay, do I have a tactic? Do I have a tactic? So you go back and forth twice. Um, twice with white, twice with black. The timing doesn't need to be precise. You don't need like a stopwatch on two minutes that's beeping or whatever. It's just like, you know, you're giving yourself a chance to really get into black shoes and white shoes and black shoes and white shoes. Okay? Overall, um, not just for your tactics, but overall for you, it's going to be great to um, dissociate yourself a little bit from your side of the board during your games. Okay? It's not just going to help you with like the board vision x's and o's but also with the emotional side of the game it'll help you to like not care that much if your side wins to be seeing both sides okay um you know how everybody always wants me to flip the board so that whoever's supposed to move is at the bottom of the board right but like for me there's no such thing I'm just looking down on the board and I'm looking at like the truth. I'm not married to black winning or white winning, even if it's my game, right? If I've just played this game with somebody and I lost the game, I'm not trying to prove that I should have won the game. I'm just just figuring out what's going on in the game, right? And when I play a game, I don't really care too much if I win or my opponent wins. I mean, I'm trying to play good moves and, you know, implement some things I've learned and, you know, notice something interesting and enjoy myself, but it's not as important that I win or lose. Um, and so this will help you in that area as well <laughs> as with the calculation. So um, it's going to help you see moves coming from your opponent. That's like, that's like the most important thing that you're going to get from this is seeing moves coming from your opponent it's going to help you to be able to switch perspectives during the game it's also an exercise that asks you to try and find the moment when somebody might have a tactic which i think is is part of it also for you is knowing when there may or may not be a tactic for the opponent or for yourself a little bit less but also for yourself um and uh, and finally, it's going to help you not be so attached to your side winning. Okay. Any questions about how that exercise works, X's or O's wise? It's always black to move, even when you're looking from white side. That makes sense. Okay. And uh, if a game is complicated and interesting, you can do the same exercise with more than one position from the same game. Does that make sense? So this game here, we might look at edit and i don't know what you've looked at so far i'm sure like even as you're listening to me speak your brain is processing something about the position so you may have looked at like queen c6 attacking two pawns you might look at like fe4 trying to play rook f4 those are two ideas that might pop into your head let's say you look at them for a couple minutes and you decide neither of them wins anything like they're interesting moves but here are white's defenses so you keep playing the game rook c5 is their tactic not so much, EF5, not so much, you keep going, right? B4, takes, takes. You just keep going, right? Is there a tactic? Well, there's one thing attacked, white can probably defend it. Is there a tactic? Hmm, maybe let me look at it, right? So now, okay, maybe we take this back and we say, okay, in this position, did white have knight takes E5 in, in this situation here? So you can look at that now from white and from black, right? So you're white, does knight takes e5? Is that a good move? And then you switch back to being black and you're like, shoot, I played queen d7 before I noticed knight e5. Like, is that a problem? 
right? Or if you want to, another way of thinking about it from black, if you don't want to put yourself in the, oops, did I mess up and it's too late, I'm just trying to figure out if I messed up situation, you can actually take back a move and look at this position from black's perspective and say, can I play queen d7 or is knight e5 going to be a problem? Right, another way of doing it. So you can play around with it. I've just invented this for you today. So it's not something I've had people do before and I don't have any like strict rules about how it has to be done. Um, but there's a couple of key components to it, right? One is that you're looking for whether or not there are tactics. You don't know if there are tactics as you play through the game. And number two is you wanna flip sides a couple times on the perspective. Okay, I think I definitely need to practice uh, seeing the moves from the other side of the board. Okay, cool. I think that'll help. No questions about how this will work for you for now? No, I think I've, I've got a couple of books of Tal and Alakine. <laughs> to <try laughs> Play through some of their games? Okay. Yeah. Cool, all right. So um, that, um, I know you guys all spend time on chess during the week. I think this is something that um, you could each do, you know, for maybe, uh, maybe like a 15 minute session would be good once a day, something like this. Obviously, if, if, if you're busy someday and you can't do it, that's fine. I'm not um, going to be demanding homework turned in or anything like that. But I'm just giving you guys a recommendation of what might be good for you. I think about a 15-minute about a session of doing this would be pretty good. I want, um, I want uh, JB, Thierry, and Xanth for this exercise. The idea is that you calculate pretty hard while you do it. So I'm not expecting you to spend like two hours doing this, right? In your actual games, you don't have to calculate this hard every single move. I just want you to put in like a burst of calculation effort and then that's good. Then take a break, right? Um, I, I don't want this. If you do this too much, it's going to become a low effort, low energy thing by definition because you can't sustain that intensity. But I want you to practice like burst calculation, like high, high effort with this. Okay, so really have like that have that time limit on yourselves, right? Don't go over the time limit. Five minutes is, is plenty for these um, puzzles. And for just how hard I want you to work. I mean, if it were a game, you guys mostly play 15 minute games. You would never be allowed to think more than five minutes on one of your moves, right? Pretty much, I don't think, right? So there's no point practicing like a 30 minute think if you're, playing 15 minute games. Um, so you can do that with like five minutes. And if you feel like you're done in three or four, if you feel like you can go faster than five minutes, like if you if you feel like, okay, I'm pretty confident at four minutes or three minutes, go ahead and stop and, and double check yourselves at three or four minutes, right? By entering in your solution and then playing out your variations on that little analysis board, okay? And if you guys can get from like on an average of like, you know, four and a half minutes to an average of four minutes over the course of a week or two of doing this while still feeling like you're pretty thorough, that would be like a good sign of progress, right? Um, so the, I mean, the signs that you're looking for that it's going well and that you're having success with this are number one, are you missing many first moves for white or black? That's the first thing, right? And then number two, are you getting any faster? So once you've achieved thoroughness, you want that thoroughness to be faster so that you don't have to spend like a laborious three minutes looking at H3, G3, H4, G4. Like you're not supposed to look at every single legal move <laughs> to find the key moves, right? You're supposed to somehow be able to identify the critical tactical moves faster and focus on some of them, right? So... We want a thoroughness of seeing the relevant moves, but we still don't want to waste all our time looking through moves that aren't relevant. It's a tricky, tricky thing I'm asking you for, right? Kind of like speed thoroughness. Um, so that's what to look for for you all. And I think, um, I think a 10 or 15 minute session each day would probably be a good amount 
to do it with big intensity and then see how you improve after a week or two with that. Okay, if, um, if you guys are good with that, I will move on to the next group. Just a quick question on the, um, the exercise. Yeah. Three of us. How key is the writing down of the, uh, writing down of the variations as you're going through it? Like if, uh, you figure a winning chain right away, you still take time to write it down or, or it, how, how key is that to your head, right? It's important to write it down so you can check yourself. Okay. Because even like one minute later, people will often be mildly fuzzy about what they think they calculated once they start playing it out on a board. They'll be like, did I see this? I think I saw this, you know, or did I see that? Well, maybe not, but I was getting to it or, I mean, um, it's, it's very, it's very easy. So yeah, you want to write it down. And if you think you found like the answer really fast, that's fine. You write it down and then you do the double check in your head and then you play it out. Um, you don't need to keep looking for alternatives if you're sure that you found the answer. But you do need to write down what you did look at. Thanks. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think any of you are dishonest. It's just really like, like, I mean, I do it. And I'm obviously not trying to cheat myself when I'm like training at home by myself with nobody here and I'm not even going to a tournament. Like there's, like, there's nothing for me to cheat myself about, right? But I write the stuff down because that's the only way for me to be sure that I'm double checking my work. Now, everybody has different working brains and maybe some of you don't have any of that fuzziness I have. You're like, in my head, I have a transcript of my previous thoughts from three minutes ago and I can just run down that transcript. If you have that, I guess you don't need to write anything down. Uh, I I need it to be sure that I'm checking myself correctly. Thank you. I did have one more question. <clears throat> okay, so you said yeah. it was better, to, well, probably best to look at games that have a decisive result. Yeah. So if I look at a game where say, say I look at one of your games and I see that you won the game, might it be better to look at it from your opponent's perspective if I, you know, if I know that it's a game that you won? Sure. More likely, better for you to look from the perspective of whoever lost the game. Yeah. Um, so you can maybe identify the moment when a tactic's incoming, right? Like you are Bogolubov and like you're like wondering when Alyekin's hammer is going to strike. Um, and you can see if you see it coming. <laughs> Sure. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Sokolov in chat says humans are very bad at remembering what they predicted. This is a known cognitive bias. Even if it's a short time interval, Sokolov, between your prediction and then when you're sort of assessing if your prediction was right. So I've I often feel like surprisingly fuzzy, like right after doing an exercise or right after doing a game, I'm like, did I see that thing? Or I'll be like, I rejected this move because of this variation. And then, um, and then I'm, and then I play out the variation and I'm like, wait, was it really this or was it something else? That happens to me like all the time. Like today I did end game sensei with, um, Kostya. We played out some end game. And then afterwards I'm trying to like explain, what I saw and I'm like, hmm, I really don't know why, you know, I always looked at it this way instead of that way. You know, it's, it's already fuzzy and it's just a couple minutes later and I was highly focused, you know, I, I was completely into it. So he said something maybe a couple times, but the other day I really liked when he said, it's like, oh man, I haven't heard that phrase before. He said, like, oh, I had time to forget. So it's gone or something like that. I don't know. Maybe that's a common saying, but I haven't heard it before and I really liked it. So I'm going to add that to my, uh... I can't hear you well. Oh, sorry. Um, can, can they, uh, sorry, it was just Terry had a saying the other day. He's like, oh, I had time to forget. And then I hadn't heard it phrased that way before. So I liked it. Time to forget. Idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll bring in, uh, I'll bring in the 1400s now. Thanks everybody for your work. Thank, Thank you. you. See you on, Goodnight. see you on Tuesday for practice. Yeah. Yes, sir. Bye everybody.
Hey guys. Hey. Hey. All right. I'll change a couple titles here real quick. Hey. Doc. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> Fox converting into a 1e4 player. We played a training game earlier today. Oh, yeah? I'm so proud. Yeah. <laughs> it's a nice expansion. It was a crazy position. That would actually, it was really good for post-game analysis towards the end where, like, it didn't happen on the board, but it was, like, this thing where I'm like, oh, in this variation, I have two connected past pawns, but, like, apparently I'm on the thread of losing and hanging mate if I don't play perfectly. So it was interesting to look at. Good learning. Okay, so this thing here is completely mixed up. What's up? What's up? Hey, Drew. Hey, How are you? I just timed this out perfectly. I was I hit two detours on my bike trip back, so I was like, "Wait, hold on!" But I just made it. Bike trip, bike trip back from. Uh, northwest side. Oh, nice. Up by Tennyson. Like uh, Tennyson and Forty Six. Oh, I was like, were you just going for a casual bike ride in the dark? No, 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 no. Okay. Just, just visiting. Yep. Nice. Yep. Because I've had to make many bike rides at night, but I've never voluntarily done one. I like, I like biking at night. Um, I'll. I've been hit by a car at night, so I don't like biking oh. at night. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. I guess I, I mean, I hear that. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes it happens. It's not the end of the world. I'm I mean, just happy that I, I'm just happy I like, get a I, light. Yeah. And... yeah. I actually, yeah. yeah. No, not getting hit by a car, though. I'm just having no, a but, No, but having a light is a good idea. Yeah. No, I think a legal requirement, in fact. Mm hmm. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, 14 to 1600 group. Tonight, we are gonna talk about how to spend your time on chess for the four of you. All right. All right. That's what I need. Um, yeah, it's the most important thing, but um, it was fun to get to know you guys better the first couple weeks by working on some things together. Um, that said, it didn't yet tell me what your study plans are. We're going to figure them out together tonight. Um, but at least I know you well, so it'll make it easier for me to, to figure it out really quickly. Um, there's There are two components that are going to be the same for all of you. I mean, it's, it's, it's not actually like so complicated or hard to figure out. But um, to some extent, there are two components that are going to be the same for all of you, which is that all of you are going to be playing chess some amount right and actually three components that are going to be the same all of you are going to be playing chess for some amount all of you are going to analyze your own games to some amount and all of you are going to do some kind of tactics you are all also going to have a fourth area of study that you're working on and to determine that we're basically just going to ask you what you are most interested in studying right now. And then I will tell you uh, what would be a useful way to study that and how much of your time to spend on it. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so first, I'm gonna like write as we do this. Um, Seth, how much time per week do you spend on chess? Um, I 
Uh, chess improvement or just any chess? Because any chess? Some, any chess. Um, yeah. Cause like, you know, sometimes like I, I like watching like, you know, chess streams or whatever. I'm not really feel like, of I don't really feel like I'm working on chess, but yeah. I just I'm enjoying myself. Uh, so, um, so if you count that, um, I'm just calculating here. The rest of you can also start calculating as well, because the same question's coming around. Uh, twenty five hours a week. Okay. Maybe more. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, probably 10. Okay. Falk? I think it's like two hours per day, roughly. Okay. Andrew? 1.5 times 7. Okay. So that 10.5. Yep. Um, all right. Cool. All right. And Seth, you have what, maybe like a 15 to 10 split, like about like 10 hours of chess entertainment, maybe and 15 hours of chess play slash. Yeah, maybe something like stuff. that. Yeah, I spend a lot of my weekend, you know, on chess these mm -hmm. days. And so we, we, so we so define that question by that answer. Are we talking about watching streams? when you include that or like what is the question like refined as i i sort of now have number i've sort of like guesstimated split seth's time between study time and watching streams or just because my an my answer was more like playing games ish mm -hmm. more or less the streaming side which would be more than that okay. so i don't know yeah and then like if i was to include everything i would probably put it up to like you know 20 hours a week but that yeah. includes all the you know so i'm yeah i'm doing chess on this channel like, like five or six hours a week at the moment yeah yeah <laughs> all right cool um all right we'll talk another day about how to use your 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 tactic time but um, you should probably each be doing 15 minutes a day of something related to tactics. And we'll, we'll figure out what that is later. And that's out of one to two hours per day, depending on the person. So 15 minutes of tactics. Still leaves us some room. Okay. Um, and with that amount of time, we can calculate, basically, you should probably spend about 50% of your time playing and 50% um, studying something. So for Seth, that means um, out of your 15 hours, that would be 6.3 of playing and 6.3 of studying 15 that'd be seven yeah. and a half and are you half. sure is this it's are you what drit he uh, he's wrong are right are we the math yeah are you? <laughs> <laughs> okay 7.5 and 7.5 were you hoping i would just nod and be like yep yep that's right <laughs> I don't know what yeah. I hoped for, but I enjoyed myself. All right. <laughs> Thanks, man, All teacher. Right. All right. I'm yeah. some of the things I hear. <laughs> so, what year math do you teach? Uh, I'm teaching sixth grade at the moment. Nice. Oh, shoot. But Does for, like, for Drew, it's out like, of 10.5. Uh, How do I divide that by two? Mm, you can't actually. It can't no, be done. No, it's impossible. Oh, okay. 
Um, yeah. Sorry. We don't divide Call it this. time just to yeah. make life easy. Okay, so the first thing we've broken it into is your play time and your studying time. Okay, so Seth, you've got seven and a half hours in a week to study. Drit, you've got five hours to study, whatever that may be. Um, Falk, seven hours. Drew, 5.25 hours. Um, out of that time, you already have one hour and 45 minutes of tactics. It's a big chunk of it right there. Um, so I'll keep breaking it down. All right, Seth, um, what are you interested in studying in chess? Um, I, I, all of it. I guess, but, um, you know, I, hard to say, I, I think, I think like middle games is, is my current wanting to study thing. Mm -hmm. Um, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I figure I need to get into, I, I need to do a lot of, of end game study at some point. I thought where I'm at middle game study would be most beneficial and, for my play and um i don't know it's also i guess also the most interesting part of the game too. okay but yeah i, I really know. i i'm really sort of asking like what you know what do you want to what would you be interested in you don't necessarily know what will have the best payoff for you like you can right. guess at that but yeah, yeah i can exactly. i can already well, I guess don't. at that better than you and i'm i'm just asking what you want to do that's true yeah i've been sort of just kind of guessing at it myself without knowing actually knowing um right. I don't know. I like. I don't know. I I, I, I like middle games and end games both, but I, I guess middle game. Is, okay. uh, yeah, is more fun for you at the moment, mm -hmm. which is yeah. cool. I mean, right now I'm having a lot of fun studying end games. That wasn't always the case for me, you know. And when it wasn't, I didn't study them, and now mm -hmm. I do. All right. So um. Okay. So you want to do something with middle games, um. Uh, let me assess what you've already studied in terms of middle games. Have you ever read a book about strategy? I I ju I've like just started one recently. What's it called? Uh, uh, Mastering Chess Strategy, Johan Helston. Mastering Chess Strategy. Okay, recommended by Kostya. Yeah. Um, how do you study it when you study it? Um. So the book is organized. It's got like sections um, of examples, which are like long sequences from games. And then he also each section has a few uh, has like one or two example game, entire games for the idea. Mm -hmm. And then so I go through each game. I actually have like a Lee chess study where I find the uh, I was like doing them. Um, I was like setting it up on a physical board was a little, I figured this would be like slightly more efficient. So I set it up on a virtual board and I make like, I import the PGN, I find the game, import the PGN, then go to the position. And then I make the moves, even though, you know, I ignore the list of moves and I make the moves mm -hmm. and then I make all, and then I put all the sidelines that he puts in, you know, as, mm -hmm. as I'm reading through them. And then, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then, you know, I'll go back and then after I read his annotations of the game and play through it, I'll go back through and click through and try to kind of see, make sure I understood the ideas, especially in, and in like the sidelines and stuff. So, you know, so that, that'll take, you know, and I'll go through and then you go through the examples and then there's like exercises for each one. Mm -hmm. So I, I really have, um, I, I fallen, I haven't really been reading it in the last couple of weeks. I had started it. And then the last couple of weeks, I've kind of allotted my time to other stuff, mostly because I'm just like, it just seems silly to like be worrying about like finding perfect ways to improve your your pieces or whatever when I'm just blundering all the time. 
So I'm like, I'm like we did it. I was like, get back to tactics and stuff. Anyway, and then I do the exercises. I try to. I also put them up on a board. Um, right now, my physical board is actually in my classroom at school. So I usually just so again, I do that one on a on an analysis board on Lee Chess or Chess.com. Mm -hmm. I just set up the position and then I just look at it and try to solve it. Um, you know, and I. I was, I'll spend 15 minutes in exercise maybe and okay. do say what I think is the answer then look up the answer. Okay. Now, do you enjoy the time you spend reading that book? Yeah. Yeah. For the most part. If I said, um, if, uh, if you, if you knew that mm -hmm. like, you know, tomorrow evening you're going to have like half an hour to like play through some you know some examples from that book is that something you would look forward to yeah like an ice yeah. cream mm, like an ice cream like if you knew that know. tonight you were gonna have ice cream mm -hmm. is it is that like knowing that you're gonna have some time with helston uh uh The chess, yeah, the chess study you do should be enjoyable enough that when you're not doing it, you're like looking mm -hmm. forward to when you'll get to do it. Not yeah. that the other parts of your life should be dreary, but, <laughs> but it should, but it should be like, oh, there's going to be like this cool thing. Like, you know, let's say you're like biking home and you're not worrying about a car hitting you. Um, are you thinking like, oh man, like at home... There's like an ice cream sundae and Helston waiting for me. Um, mm, I don't know. I, I enjoy it. Yeah, maybe not to that extent. I think like the thing I like most is like, I like, I guess, I guess I can enjoy reading, but, um, or I like listening or, or watching or whatever, like, analysis of of games i guess mm -hmm. that that would be like that would be like more of like if if you could watch but, a video of helston analyzing the games live that would be more engaging it, yeah it'd be a little more engaging but yeah i just there's certain um yeah i like i um right i like just like detail i like you know i guess if when i'm I guess when I'm like thinking like, okay, here's like chess improvement time and what, but like, I'm thinking something that's more like for me than for improvement. It's like, yeah, finding, you know, some, some, some good video on some classic game or like some really cool game or something, you know, with could detail. Be, could be and it, it could be a book too. I just don't yeah. have any books like that, I guess, right. but. Yeah, and I hope all four of you realize that even though I'm like asking questions specifically to Seth right now, this is relevant to all of you, right? So as like an example of what I'm talking about with Seth, when I was reading My Life in Games by Mikhail Tall, like when I was doing other stuff, I was like, I can't wait to read more of that book, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'd be in school and I'd be like, there's a 10 minute break between like classes and I'm going to like read another page of Mikhail Tal. I'm like aware that he's in my backpack, right? Um, yeah. That, uh, if possible, you want your study time to be things that you feel like that about. Um, and I know all four of you are really into chess, so I, I'm like almost certain there's some kind of chess something that you feel that way about, right? Like, you know, like Seth, you'll like be like popping into like the stream during like a break period or something like that, um, or something like that. So like there, there's something in chess that that's making you be like, oh, I want, I want some more of that. So right, that's true. Yeah. So we have to make sure that like your study time is like that as well. Gotcha. Yeah. Um. And Helston comes highly recommended, but I'm not. I'm not feeling that like spark of like, 
you just like yeah. tearing through it and you wish there were like three more volumes um it well it's a it's a it's a pretty immense volume so uh mm-hmm. but yeah um I don't know, maybe maybe not i do like it though. Mm-hmm. um and i do like sort of strategic ideas i like like you know maneuvers and stuff like that um, okay but uh yeah okay so maybe if we could find some really good videos about karpov games mm-hmm. yeah I've, I've seen some karpov i mean i love like i love tactical games too of course like who doesn't right. but, um you know and ex- attacks but yeah right yeah, videos of Karpov. Games. But like a Karpov game where it's like here he plays a three because he's already seen that he's going to move his knight through a two to like b four like seven moves from now and. Yeah, one I've revisited a couple of times just like, um, because like like certain games I think I, I remember coming across more of a beginner and then like see like you know six months later like looking I mean like would I understand this game better now you know and I like I mm-hmm. remember like the Karpov. Kasparov, like the whatever, the light square game, right? The one where he, what? Yeah, I, I, it's been a while since I watched, so maybe I like go revisit that one because I remember like seeing, hearing about that game. There's like the the light square symphony game for Karpov, and then the octopus night game for Kasparov against Karpov, and like mm-hmm. I've I've revisited both those games a couple of times for um, both, like just trying to like like um understand like the brilliance and and the whole kasparov karpov match i think it's like the most fascinating thing in, that's ever happened in chess yeah to me yeah for yeah sure. so um yeah yeah i agree that's one of the most fascinating things to me um have you ever read kasparov's autobiography where he talks about that match no I haven't. It's um, it's not like chess analysis. It's just like what it felt like to play that match. <laughs> yeah, no, that would that that would be cool. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, you might enjoy that. I agree. That's that's like perhaps like the most riveting episode in all of chess history to me. Mm-hmm. Like for people to just be like playing each other like month after month. <laughs> It just can't end, and like it's just oh man, yeah. Um. Okay, so um, so maybe maybe a good area of study for you would be that match. I mean, yeah. Just like if we could just find some like good videos about every game from that match, one after the next. I wonder if anybody's done that yeah you see a lot well yeah i don't i don't think i've watched a lot of videos about um you know the 800 draws but uh, definitely the decisive games the decisive games yeah all the decisive games i'm sure are covered right um yeah so but i think yeah i mean it's it's very high level yeah like you can't you can't understand everything um and and actually like the wins are in a sense clearer than the draws but the draws sort of like build up the tension of like the months and months of like trying to break through but it's like it's easier to tell in a win like who broke through and why than in like a draw to like know sort of what 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 was happening when a lot of the tactics are below the surface but I think I think like looking through all those games might be one option for you if something fun to do. Yeah, but the decisive games, a lot of them have situations where one side is like plus six and material is completely equal, you know, and it's like like and then you just go why, <laughs> you know, and you have to try to like figure it out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't because I wouldn't know that one side was plus six. Um, yeah, that's true, but. But I would um, probably understand who had the advantage. Um, right. Well, you go through an analysis and you're just like, and then, right, or like the the anterior is like, and now it's just lost. And you're like, oh, <laughs> like, I agree. It looks, it looks good. But uh, there's been nothing actually won 
here, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think that the the Kasparov autobiography. Whoops. Okay. I think the Kasparov autobiography is called Child of Change. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I think it's that one. Anyway, I'll double check it for you later off stream. But I would recommend that your study time might include that. Plus, I'll try and find you some videos about the match. All right. Okay. Unless you already have like, you know, unless you already have a source for for analytical videos on the match, but um but that's what I would recommend for you. And um you could probably you've got 7.5 hours minus 1.75 of tactics makes 3.27 hours and then you've got to analyze your own game for 6 hours. That leaves negative e to the i pi mm -hmm. for the karpov kasparov match um so let's say two point seven five hours a week okay and for each of you when i assign you like an area to be studying on that may just be something you do for one week or two weeks or three weeks. Depends how long it takes you to like study that before you move on to something. But that's always going to be your bonus topic mm -hmm. in addition to playing games, looking over your own games, and doing some tactics. Yeah. I do one day want to get back to Houston. But... Sure. I mean, I hear it's great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Seth, um, your plan is um, you have 7.5 hours to play, 1.75 hours for tactics, 2.75 hours for Karpov Kasparov, and three hours of self-analysis. Okay. Okay, that's your breakdown. Um, Dritt, what do you want to do? Uh, I really enjoy analysis of full games, more mm -hmm. so than like a position. Uh, so back when I had, uh, was taking chess lessons from another IM, one of my favorite things for homework was, cause sometimes you'd like give me positions and be like, write out lines, uh, which is fine. But like, I, I like having the whole game and trying to understand the whole narrative, like building two critical moments. Yep. I don't know. Tactic, like I'll, I'll, if, if we should do tactics, like I'll eat my veggies and do tactics, but I always find them kind of like random and boring. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we're not going to make you do something random and boring. Um, and when you say like old games, like a hundred years old, 10 years old, Oh, sorry, but old, I, I don't, I guess I shouldn't have even said old, just like higher level games. Higher level I mean, games, okay. Maybe not the super old stuff where everyone always played like the King's Gambit against someone who like was 500 points lower rated than them and won mm -hmm. beautifully. Like, I think those are just kind of like fun to watch, but not really, I don't know. It's hard to get stuff out of it, I think. Yeah. Um. But but I it's not like the decade. To, if it's the 1950s or the 2010s, that doesn't really make it a difference. Matter. Okay, so you like looking at some high level games, and how would your previous coach have you look at them that you liked? Like, would he have you like look at the game on your own and then share what you thought of it and then give you feedback on? Yeah, like the same way I would analyze my own games with like notation and my own lines and what I'm thinking. Like obviously no computer, right. and then just like just do that. And you know maybe I miss things because they're high level games of course, but yeah. it is what it like i think i actually learned i think the idea of doing tactics is to like learn new ideas and patterns in the tactics yeah but i think like even though it's a it's slower to get to a given idea if i see it in like a real game like i learn it better 
I mean, that's to me even the same thing with a lot of the stuff you guys do on Dojo. I'm following along like a real game between two people who are 2,000 rated even. It's like it's easier for me to um to learn ideas that way than just right. seeing tactics puzzles with the same ideas. And today when we were looking at um, Alexa versus McCarrot and you popped and your first question was like, how did the game start? Like, like what's the thread that connects the starting position yeah. to the current position? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. And like something concrete I learned from that. Like I, had, there was that line where I wanted to play like Bishop D2, keeping the dark square Bishop because all the queenside pawns were on dark squares. Mm -hmm. But like we played through that and it was just clear, like the Bishop was never going to get entry to the squares it needed to, to attack those pawns. Like yeah. that's something concrete. I, 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 learned and like we'll try right. to keep in mind where it's like you know you have this base rule that you want to keep the bishop the same color of your opponent's pawn but like if it doesn't have a plan to get in there it's not really gonna ever do anything yeah and you saw that in the game alexa kept the light squared bishop mm -hmm. and one of the main reasons for that probably was that black had pawns at c5 and e5 by keeping a light squared bishop he could control the f5 square and mm -hmm. keep the black king from getting into his position you yeah. remember what happened? You had the d2 bishop defending the g5 pawn, and um, your pawn was defended, but the black king could get active, and I was basically saying black was borderline winning, and then the more I looked at it, the more convinced I was that black was simply winning yeah. because they could activate their king um, too far into the position. And so Alexa kept the light squared bishop and was able to hold the line. The black king never got into the position, and that basically like defines... 90 plus percent of end games if you can keep the king from getting into your position like you draw it's basically like a full board fortress kind of situation and if the other side can eventually force a, a penetration into the game for their king then they win even if they've just got a mild positional advantage um so sure. yeah very you know very like deep chest truths in there uncovered um Okay, and when's the last time you did something like that? When's the last time you took like a, a game from Alyekin or Topolov or somebody and just analyzed it out for yourself? Well, there was that guy that tricked me and Seth into analyzing That's right. uh, Ready Alyekin on stream. <laughs> I don't know if you count that or not. Yeah, I guess that counts. <laughs> it was that. I was very critical of uh, one of them. Yeah. Both of them, maybe. Yeah. I think both of them. Like, yeah. Like, what? I was like, what is, I'm like, what are these night moves to the side of the board? And what are these openings where no one's taking the center? I was disgusted. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, I just popped yeah, in for 10 were... seconds and I was like, oh, they're analyzing like Rats Yalyekin. That's really cool. Uh, yeah. So was the, I've, I've done it like, here play. and there, but never much. Part of it, it's like, it's like watching TV on Netflix where you're like paralyzed with choice. Yeah. And then also, um, what's helpful is like to know the idea I'm supposed to learn in a given game. Like I was, for, like for one of them, it was a Tigran Petrosian game. It's like, hey, like you should learn better how to defend, and like look how he defends and defends and defends against Kasparov, and like eventually counter punches and wins. Mm -hmm. And like having that little kernel in my mind really helped me throughout the game, for at least knowing kind of what I'm trying to learn without being given like this was the critical move or the critical line or something right. like that. Okay. But sort of like you would get like a, 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 a brief, right? Like here's yeah, just what like you're... a short brief. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I will almost said a brief brief and then I couldn't bring myself to say it, but yeah. Um, okay. So, so I could, I could help you choose. I could say, here's a game. That's great. Okay. Cool. So, So I think what we're looking at for you, Dred, is one game per week that I that I'll give you, and you've got an hour and a half. 
okay. to look at it. And it's probably about it because you're also going to want to spend one and a half hours looking at some of your own games okay. that you play each week, right? Whether it be like a rapid tournament of four rounds that you look at one or two of those games for like half an hour or whatever the source may be. Um, or like, I don't know if, if you're, if you're playing like the classical tournament in May or June. No. Okay. Um, but anyway, whatever the source might be, like you'll probably want to spend an hour and a half looking at some of your own chess. Um, I'm hoping to start OTB soon in like June. Nice. Nice. National Open, maybe? <laughs> yeah. You know, they, they love the unrated players, I'm sure. <laughs> right into the national. Here I come. Here I come. All right. Um, cool. Uh, Falk, what do you want to spend your time on? So I'm not sure, but I think it's more like for me, uh, I just enjoy improving and learning new things. Mm -hmm. So nowadays when I like study chess, I just go outside in our garden, take my board and a book, and then I just work on it. So mm -hmm. um, I'm happy if I improve and learn new things. So for example, like a month ago, I didn't know how to like how a chessboard without notation was properly rotated. And the book I'm working on, the Soviet Chess Primer, like on the second page or so, um, already says that um, each player should have a light square to the right side. And now it's like stuck in my mind. <laughs> and, I, and I just now um, know how to uh, rotate a chessboard. Mm -hmm. So it's like I enjoy like n learning new things. And um, what I want to, what I, um, so I tried uh, setting up a training plan too. So um, what I'm, what I was thinking I should work on the most is calculation and uh, calculation and uh, visualization, since uh, it's what I find myself struggling with the most. Like uh, I was playing a classical game the other day, and uh, I had this long line uh, in my mind, and I, um, that re relied on my opponent playing like uh, uh, rook a1, but my knight was covering the square, and I just didn't uh, <laughs> see it, and I, and I kept calculating. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so that's like what I uh, work on the most right now. Like I try to do, so what I try to do is like 90 minutes of study and like I do like Pomodoro sessions. So it's like three sessions. What and, sessions? Pomodoro? Um, yeah, it's like 25 minutes of studying and five minute break. Okay. <laughs> it's like what I study with. So it's kind of, it kind of works for chess too for me. So Pomodoro do, like Italian for tomato? Yeah, like the technique. It's called Pomodoro technique. Okay. It's like a studying technique. Okay. Um, <laughs> I love how I love how David knows what it is in Italian and is like not aware yeah. of the technique. That is that's great. <laughs> like, I okay. know the word. Is Pomodoro like somebody's name or like somebody like invented a tomato technique or I think it's like a tomato. Like It is like a tomato. It, yeah. The okay. time I use has, has like a tomato icon, so <laughs> I guess it's from there. Who knows? Okay. All right. So you but do yeah, three. So, so you do three sessions. So yeah, it's in like a day of twenty-five of and five. Studying, yeah, yeah. And I try to do like two. I mean, I work on the. Um, I forgot what it's called, but the um, Yusupov book, the first book, like foundations of something. It's like um. I think it's called build up your foundation also. Okay. Um, from R to uh, um. Yusupov, the it's kind of a tactic and calculation book, I think. Um, so I'm working on that for one session, Hold and then I try to do the fundamentals. Uh, yeah, here's like a popular series of books. Yeah, it's actually adapted from his German series, but I'm working with the English one <laughs> <laughs> just to make sure you won't know what anything is in German. Oh, no, it's, uh, it's just the uh, books are nicer and newer, and I guess it's the same position that he uh, talks about. But yeah, it's like 25 minutes of that. And then I tried to do, like, I only started like 10 days ago, but I tried to do like 25 minutes of tactics too. Mm -hmm. And then, like, I try to analyze the game or do like end game studies. 
So the fundamentals, this book has everything in it. Strategy, tactics, positional play, end games. It's it's a mix of everything. Uh, yeah, kind of. Okay. So he uses the same system as our as uh as the science teacher of like going through topics and then at higher and higher levels revisiting the same topics yeah the idea is you do like a bunch of like first you are introduced to a, a new tactical idea yeah then you practice practice it a bit and then at the end you do like a re revision exam and see how well you do and if you fail you just go and study the chapter again okay interesting okay so um Okay, so it seems like, whoops, I just messed something up. Okay. Oh, no. I messed up twice, so then when I fixed it, I, okay. Um, okay, so it seems like you're interested in working on basically every aspect of the game at once, as long as it's, like, leading to improvement. You like variety and you like new stuff. Um, yeah, for sure. Do you, do you ever play 1E4 in your games? Well, I started a few days ago, <laughs> so yeah, I am like, mixing it up a bit now. Okay. Like the the only reason I played one d four was because I learned the London system, okay. and I went from there. Like there was never like an. And then you left never, the London system yeah. behind, but still were playing d four. Yeah, and then I tried to improve on it. Like I left right. it a bit behind and tried to play other stuff. Okay. Got it. Okay, so you're into like branching out into everything. Yeah. Gradually. Okay. Cool. Um, well, the Yusupov book sounds good in that case. Um, and also, yeah, I think the I think the switch in the opening repertoire is probably going to accelerate your learning at this point. I don't know how long you've been playing D four without the London system, but. I would, for while, like I would guess so. for at least like six months. Well, yeah, for like, I, I think I played like four or 500 games of it. I bet. Okay, and I yeah. didn't play like E4 once. Yeah. So you've definitely, you've definitely um, explored that some and could explore some new things. So I think like a total like opening swap for you in the games you play will probably match up well with your general um with your current approach to learning um so i think i can recommend that for you which openings would you recommend like i was what i still don't have like um for one against 1e5 i was trying to i want i want to try the sicilian opening a bit mm -hmm. and yeah. see how that works out yeah so but do. um i'm not sure against one d4 like i was mm -hmm. I, got, I tried the Grimfeld and the Nimzo Indian a bit, mm -hmm. and yeah, it fits. Like I played the Grimfeld once, and I like I watched a video earlier, and I could remember the moves. And I, the first opponent I played against, played like exactly like, like the ten main moves, <laughs> and I was immediately discouraged. It was the, a bit. Uh, so you it was you've, you've played only action. one game with the Grunfeld. Yeah, it, it and it had ten moves of but, of opening theory, and that it was. That didn't excite you. I mean, it was the ex, 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 uh, change variation, what it's called. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of forced the first few moves. Yeah. And the, the moves I played were not optimal, but they were at least somewhat played. So. Okay. But yeah, I want to try it again. I just what opening have you mainly played against D four? What opening have you played two hundred times? Um, the semi slav. The semi slav. Okay. So a flexible Queen's Gambit that has themes from the Queen's Gambit declined and the Slav defense. Sometimes you grab the pawn on C4. Sometimes you play. Sometimes you break with E5 or C5. Is that right? You have experience using all three of those. Yeah, for sure. Approaches. Okay. Um, that's good. The semi Slav is like a pretty complicated opening normally somebody would learn like the slav or the orthodox queen's gambit first and then start playing the semi-slav once they have some idea about both of those <laughs> branches um uh and so when you say nimzo indian or grunfeld those are just like different new tastes those aren't openings that you know well yet um i played the nimzo a bit like 
it just felt so natural for me to play it like when you mm -hmm. just um it, it's um easy to play i think yeah well it, it felt easy to play so i played it when i played the london system but then i stopped for a few hundred games okay and i i only played hey, the semi-slav hey fuck i think we could practice uh nimza together yeah sure yeah yeah okay so if you're gonna go sicilian and 1e4 what opening should you practice against d4 right now you've done the nimzo you've done the semi-slav How are you with isolated queen pawns? Okay, it's one of the things I avoid. It's absolutely awful for me. To have um, it or to play against it? I like to play against it, but I don't like to have it. It's um, When I played against Seth and he played the Tarash, um, mm -hmm. I was like looking at the Shanklin course and he recommended like a line where um, white does not end up with an isolated pawn. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't recall it when we like, not, on, on Tuesday I tried to play the same line again, but I couldn't recall it exactly. Mm -hmm. So I play like e6, uh, um, e3, mm -hmm. instead of like the, I think it was knight c3 that was recommended. Okay. Or, or no, um, I had to take the pawn, so, it's, um, so he plays with an isolated, isolated pawn and I don't. But, mm. um, yeah, I got a yeah. pretty good position on Tuesday. But yeah, I don't like to play uh, with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's good to it's good to rotate through all this stuff. Um, so you have some experience playing it, but always from the black side, um, or sorry, always from the you know against the IQP side. Um, against D four, it almost doesn't matter what you do next as long as it's not the semi Slav or the Nimzo. Mm -hmm. So um, I mean. Two openings that pop into my mind are Queen's Gambit accepted or Slav defense. Yeah, I can check them out. I will write it down. Write and it I down. would I would pick one and and basically for this whole repertoire swap, because you're doing it all at once, right? You're going for mm -hmm. E4, you're going for Sicilian, and you're going yeah. for one of those other openings. Um probably with how frequent you play, two months is a good amount of time to do it and then swap again. Yeah, sounds good. Um, do you have in mind already what Sicilian you're gonna play? Uh, I was going to play the Khan Sicilian. Okay. Khan. Yep. Sounds good. Okay. So that's a good plan for your, for your repertoire and it's gonna allow you to also um, learn more territory through like your own games as far as exploring new territory mm -hmm. um so i would say for the next couple weeks uh for the first two weeks of this i'd like you to play your new openings without studying them okay that sounds terrifying okay so no opening theory not even like you know what um you know what are some games in the con sicilian that fabiano caruana played or anything like mm -hmm. that like just nothing just you go out there and you you check it out yourself okay so when i analyze my games i paste them into chess space or leeches and then i see what moves are popular and where where i deviated from it right but that's still okay right so, no or... you'll just have to skip that step for two <laughs> weeks okay? okay you can start doing that in three weeks okay it's not it's not okay. like a big it's not like a big thing <laughs> Um, so two weeks without learning the openings you are playing. Okay. Okay. And then for weeks three through eight, you can learn stuff about the openings while you play them. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what I would focus on when you get to weeks, um, three to four is to take some of your study time and use it to play through Grandmaster games in your new openings. Okay. Um, that, that would be like, I would basically make that my, my main extra activity for those, for those two weeks, weeks three and four. 
So I really believe in having some focus. It's great that you're like interested in everything and like working on everything, but I would yeah. still like focus on something or other for at least a week, if not two weeks, and then and then the next thing. So you can go all over yeah. the place, but you know, at least for a because we're basically in a week where you have seven hours total of studying of which one and a half, 1.75 is tactics. Um, that's uh, leaving you about two hours a week to study your own games and about yeah. three hours a week to work on something else. So, I mean, if you didn't stay on the same topic for one to two weeks, you'd be spending less than five hours on a topic. It's not really like an, much of an exploration. So... So I think I think focusing on on one thing at a time and for your first two weeks while you're not yet studying your openings, I think continuing to study the Yusupov book is a great idea. Mm -hmm. So I would do um, three hours a week of the Yusupov book for weeks one through two. And then for weeks three through four, that three hours would switch to three hours of playing through GM games in your new openings. And you've Sounds got good. you've got like a huge amount of territory of new openings, so you'll easily find lots of interesting games to to play through. Um, when you play through those games, you don't need to like understand them fully. You don't need to analyze them in depth. Um, you're really sort of starting to see like the shape of 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 what what high quality games look like in that opening right you're getting that story that thread from start to end that that dripman and and myself also really um yeah. ap appreciate when we're trying to study stuff um so that's where i would that's where i would start with in those weeks uh three and four with the opening is just playing through a good number of those games you don't have to play through it quickly just because you're not analyzing it you can really sort of like stop in some position of interest to you on your i imagine you'll probably be doing this on like a chessboard probably you, uh, yeah most likely you'll i don't know print out games and bring them into the garden or something but um <laughs> you, you can you can take your time playing through the games but you don't need to do anything strenuous like like writing down variations of why one move did or didn't yeah. work on some move like pff, you know let it go you're just letting the game tell you its story Okay. Um, and you can fun. do it. You can do it at the pace that you enjoy. So that um, that gets you through weeks three and four of your training plan. Um, and um, Okay, um, I'm seeing a way to tie all three of your studies together, which is cool, but um, I keep going. So what would you do after week four? Um, after week four, you're probably going to want to start learning memorized variations for your new openings or something like that although i think that's kind of unnecessary but if i tell you not to you'll probably just rebel um <laughs> yeah probably <laughs> so there's no reason to create tension between us um now you're all I about guess. the tension david <laughs> I like holding the tension in chess positions. I like not trading. That's true. No, and, and you started out our first week with how to argue. Making so. you guys argue with each other, yeah. <laughs> but I don't want to create create one of those situations between like parents and kids where like the kids feel like they have to lie to their parents about did you or didn't you like go do this thing last night and yeah. all that kind of stuff. By week four, Falk is your teenage daughter. Yeah, that's <laughs> all. <laughs> that's all just gonna be unhealthy. So, um, so what can he do? Um, we'll give him. We'll give him one week at a time to look at variations in one of his three new openings. Okay, so. 
you get you'll start with your black openings you'll do one week on the con then one week on the slav or queen's gambit accepted or whatever mm -hmm. you picked and then in the third week you can look at some e4 yeah sounds good and um what's going to happen when you hit week eight and do like a a new repertoire swap is you'll get to do another two weeks of Yusupov then, right? When you rotate when you rotate your repertoire and have another couple weeks of playing stuff without without studying that new opening. So when you switch from whatever, the Sicilian to the I don't know, the Pierce defense or something or whatever, right? You'll again get two weeks of, of Yusupov. If that makes sense. That's sort of like I mean, we're guessing a little bit far out into the future by now, but that could be how it sort of looks as you get there. And how do I find like master games? Like I've never studied one. Do I just go to chess games and like enter my opening and pick whichever one I like or? Uh, yeah, you're gonna need like a bunch of them. So um, I can show you over here um, if you wanna learn some games. So I go to like Explorer. Uh, yeah. And then I'll put in um, like the con first. If queen I can remember, if I can remember what the con is, there's yeah. a queen out somewhere. It's like yeah, it's like a knight or but with e6. Okay, so if if I got it right, and this is the con. Oh, it says Sicilian defense con variation. All right, I got it. Um, mm. so you go for this, and then uh, you want to click see all GM games from this position. It'll be at the bottom of this list of moves, but you see right now it's not yet showing you that option, right? Uh, yeah. That's because there's too many games still, okay. right? So it's like you can't click on a link to have it show you 15,000 games. <laughs> it's like, sorry. David, I'm pretty sure you click on the number. It still isn't low enough, but I've always had to click on the number. Is okay. there another way to do it? I'm just kind of curious. Oh, yeah. You know what? On these numbers that aren't like fifteen to 20,000, you could just click on the number. Yeah, it looks like. <laughs> Although I think that's um. what... There is after bishop e2 and not what's shown on the screen. Maybe right, it is, I'm exactly. I'm just trying to learn myself how to so, do this right. So what I did, Falk, um, when I when I did this as the opening of the week, as I recall, is I took knight c3, bishop d3, and c4 and did like sort of separate searches on them, right? So what you have to do to narrow down the games a little bit is that as well, right? You click on knight c3, and then you're still going to have to narrow it down a little bit further here. So let's go knight c3... You can just pick a move that looks good to you. You can always come back and search for games with other moves, right? But you need to narrow this down a little bit. So do you feel like playing queen c7 here or b5? What kind of like appeals to you to explore first? You know, it doesn't queen c7 it doesn't matter, but you know, you pick some moves. So you play like queen c7 and then um gosh, we still have to pick between these different approaches. There's so many games. Bishop <laughs> d3 brutal brutal I, okay i don't want to say another server but um so we'll go bishop another D3. server there's another server you, where it'd be easier to do this from current position there it is okay. if you do it on lee chess it, it yeah. actually it, it'll have like the top like it, like I, on the bottom of your search it'll have like the top four rated games oh that's perfect which tends to skew recent because so, you know like if Carlson or Caruana have ever played it. It's, they're going right. to be on top. They've got right? the highest ratings. That's yeah. That's fine. You can't really go wrong by being forced to look at their games. Anyway, if you were, I mean, Carlson in the opening is something, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, so. so here, view all games from current position is what you would sort of like click here, and then you would get this list of games. By default, it always lists them in terms of like how recent they are. But I always look for them in terms of rating. So I do like rating black for your con games. And then you just pick like, you know, whatever five games in this variation. Since we had to really go down a variation, pick maybe five games in this variation, go back, pick five games in another variation, etc. Or actually, given how many variations there are, maybe only like three. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe like three games in each of a bunch of these variations, and that just gives you some games to play through okay. for weeks three and four. 
Do I pay attention to the result? Like, do I only look at black wins or? No, you just okay. click on three what games by high rated players. Okay. Yeah. And you don't need to skip draws either. Just any games. Um. All right. Um. So. So week six, your queen pawn defense. Week seven through eight, e4 variations. Because with e4, there's going to be multiple defenses that you could look at some lines against. Okay. Drew. Um, what, what? I mean, I know you have a lot of fun playing chess, but what do you look forward to um, in between your games? Yeah. Um, so I guess for, for studying at the moment, um, you know, I, I definitely feel like the opening is still the, or like, not like the first four moves, but the, you know, moves six through 10, um, maybe six through 12, you know, creating no sins is sort of, you know, the critical part for me. Okay. Um, you and, know, and is fundamental. it fundamental? And that's what you're motivated to work on right now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. because it's, you know, it, it, it comes up again and again in some of the weakest, you know, points in my game. Mm -hmm. I just always, like, I feel like for my mentality, it's kind of like I always feel overwhelmed by not calculating when there's so many pieces on the board. Mm -hmm. I just play for, well, this is easy. This is going to be fine. And it's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, just, yeah. Like, I just tell myself this <laughs> You know, like that's a move. Yeah, right? yeah. And I can, I, I can tell so you play far. a lot of moves that like you think like, yeah, that looks okay. And then other right. people play like a response. And you're like, oh, again? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So. So you want to keep working on that? Some of the exercises that we've already been been working on here. And included in that, included within that though too, I am interested in you know picking up a book. Mm -hmm. um you know because i don't have a book i feel uncultured mm -hmm. in that way so i'm also so you, you know, just very you want to have a chess book at, you know getting getting into a chess book that you know kind of addresses some of that like early i guess we would call that early mid game is that kind of you know uh but sometimes it can be move three like we saw with the scotch yeah so like <laughs> yeah um so are you telling I mean, me I, I learned i learned eventually it was knight f6 and that i probably would have been fine after knowing that move but you know in are you telling me that your home currently has zero chess books in it correct yeah the, no chess books over here wow so this chess fanatic has zero chess books so we get to pick your first chess book yeah absolutely yeah, it's wow. it's a wild world out there, right? Um, yeah. and and you know, focused on that middle middle early game. Yeah, it's Stevens. Right? Of course. Um, what's your um? I I know you play like some variety of openings, and you know, to me, your opening choices look a little bit random. Can you tell me something about what openings? you prefer or if there's something in particular you like to do in the opening or if you're really interested in any positions i like i like open like open centers in mm -hmm. general but at the same time like you know you talked a while a little bit about um the roy and, the, and like so i'm starting to find that the nimzo and king's indian which are a little bit more closed i don't know I'm just like, like, cause I, I've been playing a lot of Scandi and, and that kind of thing. And I find that like, I, I can have sight across the board. Okay. But at the same time, I, I don't know. I think, I, I think the Nimzo and the Roy are, were good. You gave that recommendation like a long time ago, but I think mm -hmm. that they're interesting to me. Cool. All right. I know what your first book will be. Oh, Wow. Yeah. I will warn you, like, if you want to play the Roy, it's like, of all the theories, some of the most I feel like, and it also tends to be really close. 
But the thing about the thing about the, the thing about like theory is that like right at anybody's rating it doesn't matter. I mean, like that, yeah. this is something that's when we made a point about like people say theory, and it's like yeah, come on, let's be honest. <laughs> I also feel like you always. I feel like you tend to go for closed Sicilians against me too. Oh, well, the Alpine has been a new thing. I mean, Gotham, yeah, has been, uh, Gotham has been influential. I won't, I won't, you know, I've been uh, watching a little bit outside of the dojo. But uh-huh. I mean, I, I'm still mainly a dojo. All right, obviously. fine. Go do a group class with him. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> <laughs> nope, no, no, no way. No way. Too toxic. Wait. All right. <laughs> Just um, all right, um, so... But- I'm writing down the name of your book. Are you, are you going to reveal it? Yeah. <laughs> he just like secretly <laughs> tells me, and like, everybody else. Yeah, you're going to be know. you're going to be reading um a book which may or may not be in one or two volumes, depending on how you find it. Okay. But um, it's uh the author is Neistat, and he wrote two or one books i don't know which it counts as but it's either winning quickly with white and winning quickly with black or just winning quickly at chess you know and inside it might be half of it is white and half of it is black okay okay so there's a there's a purple book and a green book and an orange book and a blue book that's wow. confusing that's a lot of colors <laughs> yeah we catastrophic chess so i see catastrophic Catastrophes and tactics in the chess opening. I'm just Amazoning right now. That's yeah. Hansen. Okay, so. When did chess? Oh, there it is. John Nunn. Wait, no, that's no, different. not John Nunn. Here. Yeah. Right. I mean, the point was I could send you links off stream, but um, here I'll send you one now since you're. Well, I mean, I'm so sure can... chat might be. Here's an example. Speaking. So there's there's an an edition of one of them. Um Cool. Yeah. Yakov with an I. Um Is that Dutch? What is I mean that? and it looks like this is like an Amazon link, which is <laughs> uh not where I buy books, but um anyway. Uh, that 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 gives you uh, the first step in the trail of finding that book. Okay, so you'll want that book for your cool. for your study time. Mhm. It's four bucks. Four bucks. Four dollars. Oh, four dollars. Yeah, it's very oh, stuff's stuff, very huh? cheap on that's Amazon. A, you're, you're not. You're, <laughs> oh, wow. That's uh. I might get it. Four dollars. <laughs> But you have other things to do. That's true, I know. You, but, you know, it can later someday. Right? All right. So let's bring it. Um, let's. Um, okay. So let's put it down here. The times for you as well. So you basically have. You've got um. You've got one and a half hours a week to look at your own games. Okay. And two hours a week to read that book. Okay. Okay. And um, very profitable for you, if you like, would be to occasionally use part of that two hours to basically practice playing some openings with people. Right, so mm-hmm. if you get an opportunity with one of your buddies here or on Gotham Chess's channel, if you've got some good study partners over there, hey, hey, um, no, not finding any to do to That's do a session fun. of you know just playing the first ten twelve moves with them, and then you know talk about any sins that were committed in the first twelve moves. Um, you could definitely do that for like you know thirty to sixty minutes out of your out of your two hours of Neistat. Mm-hmm. Right, you could take it out of Neistat time to play a little sin, um, without a judge, but you know, you know the idea. Right, and that would uh, work well. 
Mm-hmm. No, that's great. Free sin. Okay. And I mean, yeah, and so and like like for instance, like you know the the, the Nimzo with Folk, I think you know already matching up there because that was something I think we both talked about. Well, and, yeah, but I'm making him. Black. He's he's swapping though. He's he's swapping. I played the Nimzo. He's taking the so Nimzo out. Crit still plays the Nimzo. But anyway, I mean, yeah, I mean, he knows about it. You can play it with him. He'll know what it is. But but you'll you'll be seeing 1e4 from Falk, so you won't be able to play the Nimzo against him. And That's unfortunate. And if you play, <laughs> if you play d4 against him, he'll be playing some something else now. Um, I always play anti-Nimzo, but maybe I could start learning Nimzo from the white side. And yeah. We could. I'm not the revolutionary yet to go to d4, but... Yeah. You know. Anyway, you can always play whatever opening you want when you're just playing a couple of, like, practice openings with each other. Um, you know, um, do you know, Falk, how I beat my first Grandmaster? No. You can tell me if you want. I had never played d4 in a tournament before in my life. Never really studied it. I'd played e4 almost my whole time, but I'd also played 1f4. I had a period where I played the bird as my main opening for a while. Um, but I played, you know, that, w that was like as a young player. Um, but, you know, from maybe Word. from maybe 1500 to 2400, I'd basically only played e4. Um, and in college, I wasn't able to play chess during the school year. Um, that led to the answer to someone's question the other day, had I ever fallen asleep during a chess game? Yes. Um, I fell asleep during a midterm exam as well um, when I was playing a tournament at the same time as school. So I stopped playing tournaments in college. Um, and so, uh, but I played during the summer. So I, so I was, um, so I finished like my final exam and got on a plane to Chicago and went to a tournament there, and I was like, oh man, after nine months, I've like forgotten all my opening variations for 1e4. I've like forgotten everything. And I was afraid to sort of like pseudo play my variations while forgetting a lot of stuff about them. I didn't want to dishonor my pet openings. Every opening I play is very precious to me. So I didn't want to play like my openings and, and like get them wrong and play them badly and lose. So I was like, whatever, I'll just play d4 at this tournament. So I went into like a tournament and it's like, you know, I was probably pretty close to 2400 at that point, maybe like 2350 or so. So I go into a tournament playing all masters in the open section and I just swapped all my openings. I played one D4 as white. I played the French defense instead of the Sicilian. Um, and my very first game, I played white against the GM. I played D4, he played knight F6. I looked at the position, hmm, what looks good here? I guess I should take some space with C4, you know, and he played G6, and I was like, hmm, so his bishop's going to be on G7, he's probably going to castle kingside pretty quickly, then play something like C5 or E5 at some point, point. and I just sort of like figured out what I wanted to do, and um, I won in 15 moves, no idea, okay. no idea, any theory, nothing, so, um, so you can all just go out on a limb and play any random opening for like, you know, a random training game with each other. It doesn't doesn't really matter if you if you know it yet or not or if you're studying it. So Seth, you don't have to start studying the Nimzo in order to just allow the Nimzo in a practice game with, with Clark if you wanted to, right? Like you could Right. Uh, yeah, sure. You could play D four, C four, Knight C three and just whatever. So um, all right, so now let me tell you how we're going to bring three of you together <laughs> in your studies, okay? Um, Drew, you're kind of going to be doing the opening thing a little bit on your own-ish. Um, but the, the other three of you, there's some like clear um, overlaps in how you can do some of your studying. So um, Seth is going to be studying Karpov Kasparov match, right? So it's very easy for Seth and Dritt to look at the same game some week, right? And then share what you thought about the game with each other. Okay. And um Falk in weeks uh in weeks three and four, 
is going to be playing through GM games in the Sicilian Con and the um, whatever Queen Pawn Defense, maybe Queen's Gambit Accepted or Slav, um, and some new like E4 openings for him. So, uh, Falk, if you if you play through any game there that you think is uh, interesting, you can send it over to Dritt and say, Hey, Dritt, you want to look at this game this week? This is the game. This is a game that I like played through that looked interesting to me. Then he can study it, and then again, that gives you somebody. You know, then he can send you his analysis, and you can see yeah. what Dritt thought of that game. Um, similarly, Seth, if you're playing through Karpov Kasparov and you notice that one of Falk's openings comes up, send him that game in case the database didn't give it to him. Right. So, if you see Kasparov play the Con Sicilian for some reason. I mean, I think the match you're going to look at is a lot of D4, D5. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, maybe maybe there will be like a Queen's Gambit Accepted or a Slav Defense or something in there. Mm-hmm. If, if you see one of Falk's openings, you, mm-hmm. can send him, you can send him the game. Say, hey, Falk, I was just looking at this game this week. Um, and that will just be like a fun little point where your your work bounces off of each other and... You know, if, if Drittman wants to analyze that game, he can send it to one of you to look at what he thought of it. And mm-hmm. that'll add to the fun that you're kind of sharing that piece of your study. Okay. And yeah, well, we have probably another five weeks of our of our class together. Is this week three, I think? So we have another five weeks. So we'll definitely do at least one week where I talk to you about what you can do with your hour and a half of tactics each week. And we'll definitely have a week where we talk about what to do with your one and a half to two hours of looking at your own games. So Uh each of those will be a topic one week. One quick question I had about tactics Mm -hmm. is what is the maximum amount of time we should spend on a tactic before being like, just move on to the next one because like if it takes you 10 minutes to get it that's the same as being wrong <laughs> oh, man. in a in a in, in a practical sense yeah um in a chess.com sense <laughs> i don't know i don't like giving up <laughs> i mean i mean if you if you watched our puzzle run on dojo scrubs that like a few weeks ago we got a perfect score up to 40 yeah yeah are you ever gonna finish that run i don't know for i think we lose I mean, it you lose it after a week right it, it expires 40 that's kind yeah. of like, like mm. no i think whoever whoever's account it was if they go back into survival it'll start where they left off no it, it's a one week it holds for one week and then it dies oh uh, yeah apparently i don't know why yeah Come on. a but, little bit yeah. arbitrary yeah. No, but sorry. So to the original question, like yeah. we're spending, if I'm doing yeah. a half hour of tactics, right? Should I try to get it right in three minutes, and if not, just move on to the next one? Like what's right. The... So again, it it depends on which tactic exercise we're doing. But okay. my but my guess is, I was just gonna do the puzzles on Just.com. Right. If you're gonna do puzzles, yeah. But I mean, we'll have a whole week where we talk about this in more detail. Okay. But um, what time control game are you playing mostly when you play? Uh, rapid 15, 15. 10, 15 5. yeah okay um so realistically in your games like the max you calculate on a move is probably three minutes or so yeah. in, an, in an average game um that makes the worst what's that huh? I, said, I said it's the worst yeah so that will take eight minutes easy okay so anyway i mean like whatever you feel is like the amount of time you would spend on a critical move in a game of yours, that makes sense. which I'm sort of guessing is like three, three and a half minutes, but I might be wrong. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. But, but whatever that is might make sense to be trying to do puzzles at that level for yourself. But that's my first impression. I mean, I'll, I'll prepare a whole, a whole lesson on that topic okay. and get into it more and give you uh, specific feedback or advice on how to do your tactics training regimen. 
Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, and like you may find it like fun to occasionally do like a really hard puzzle for like, you know, 20 or 30 minutes like I like to do. If you find that fun, even if it's not practical for your own 15 minute games, it's something that you could do once every month to like okay. sit down and do like some like, you know, crazy 30 minute puzzle. Um, but that wouldn't be like a logical thing to do consistently because <laughs> it's going to be like irrelevant to your games. Yeah, I just, I don't have the, I don't know if the attention span is the right word, but like the classical stuff, I'm, I'm like glad you guys are doing it and I enjoy watching it, but uh -huh. I just, I can't do it myself. Yeah. Maybe one day. Sure. I mean, if you go, if you go OTB, there's not a lot of 15 minute tournaments. You probably be looking at like. There's a lot like, of game 30 around here. Probably be looking at like 30 or 45 or like. That's fine though, because like I'm not on my computer and I don't have my phone out and like there's nothing to do but focus. <laughs> That's always the case. If you've got a chess game available, everything else disappears. This is why you're an IM. <laughs> <100, David. laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, that and 10,000 hours of work, but we'll ignore that for now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. So obviously I can give you guys some sort of like type notes to help like clarify the breakdown here. But at least for me, it's clear what each of you, um, how each of you could spend your time over the next few weeks. So... I don't know if you have any questions now or if you want me to send you a little breakdown and then ask questions then. Um, were you going to – could you I, – I wasn't ready with the pen. Could you read me back my my hours? Yeah, I can also copy-paste it to you. But um, 7.5 hours of playing, 6.3 hours of studying, 7.5. 1.75 of tactics, mm -hmm. um, 2.75 hours for Karpov, Kasparov, and three hours for self-analysis. You have relatively a little bit more time on self-analysis than I gave some of the others. It's not it's not random, and it's not that I couldn't like do the percentages of six hours correctly. Mm -hmm. Can you say mine again, or if. If it's yep. easier, just like paste it in our Discord chat. Whatever's yep. easier for you. You've got one yeah, and a half hours to look at one game. I'll just send you guys all of it if you want. Yeah. Discord <laughs> yeah, 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 just I was gonna it. ask, but like Discord yeah. is right yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Self analysis, that'll be a big jump, I think. Yeah. I, my book is not coming in until like the fifth through the eighth, I guess. So. Okay. What kind of Amazon is this? Uh that's yeah, because, that's well, when the books are four dollars, it's not coming from Amazon. It's coming from like some secondhand book dealer that's like ah, uh, that's selling through Amazon stores. Yeah. So, so I mean, you know, but it's four dollars for for a book. So yeah, four dollars for a great time. book. Four dollars for <laughs> Drew's you first just, chess book. You just kind of mention this yeah. book like offhand without really like talking about it at all. It's just like, oh, there's the book for you. <laughs> yeah, chess books are expensive for some reason. Yeah, no, I mean, one day when like people are asking Drew for his origin story, he'll be like, I remember my first chess book, you know. <laughs> I went from losing quickly at chess to winning quickly at chess with this book. Watch out, guys. Here I come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to beat you in two moves. <laughs> yep. Yep. You, that'll be bad for me. I like to go from, <laughs> I like to go from winning to unwinning. Mm -hmm. I like the unwin games. Nice. Not everybody likes a little smack talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seth's got all kinds of material on the beating himself down front right now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know who you know who does a great job of beating people down? Chess latte. Yeah. 
Yeah. Chess.com does too. Chess.com gives me. <laughs> I, I, I log into my profile and it's like, here's your chart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, isn't Chess Latte like 30% of our age or something and just like. Yeah. Yeah. Talk. He was. That was pretty epic to watch. I enjoyed that. He was a very critical brain. <laughs> I'm pretty happy the only one on one game that like wasn't yeah. like, didn't count between me and him, I think was mm-hmm. a draw. So I was like and now he's sixteen hundred, so I'm like eh, yeah. Guys, just remember if we all play chess with the confidence of a nine year old, our potential <laughs> is just unlimited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like He was, was just, just he was just <laughs> drunk on blood. I mean yeah. <laughs> It was great. Like that was, <laughs> that was ridiculous. Things. The kids see things, man. That is much fuzzier to me. <laughs> no, and he'd just be like, "Well, I don't know how I feel about that move." <laughs> <laughs> man. Yeah. Well, I once lost a tournament game to a kid who was, like, so excited to beat me that he couldn't, like, stop grinning at the board and, like, bouncing up and down. And, like, <laughs> and he and, and he had to, like, run over to his mom to be like, Mom, Mom, I'm going to beat him. I'm going to beat him. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> he's a little twerp. No. And that's the story of how David met Kostya. <laughs> and then and then when the game's on, did you resign by throwing your king at him? No. <laughs> you gotta no. resign. Get out of here. No. No, I, I congratulated would. him you and would. he was like, let's analyze it, let's analyze it, let's analyze it. <laughs> <laughs> Were you really good at the time or something? What's that? Why was he so excited? Why was he so excited? Like uh, was he excited about this about every win or like just like beating you for some reason? I I guess is what I'm asking. I think Maybe we were playing in like such a tough tournament that like wins were hard to come by in that tournament uh, because I think it was like a tournament for people from like maybe twenty four hundred to twenty five fifty fide. Oh Jesus! Oh, so he was like, oh, wow. Kids. So it was like, um, and like he and I were probably both about like you know twenty four zero zero or twenty four ten. So we were like the trash. Sure. of that tournament mm-hmm. you know we'd been dumpstered oh, by like six wow. or seven gms and like finally he was like winning a game against an im so i don't know if he was always that excited about winning but he may have been partly or it may have been it was like round nine of a tournament where we probably had like two to three points out of eight at that point yeah not, not three maybe two points out of eight or something so. is this, so, like, is this so now a like famous kid under 10? he's under 10 no, he was maybe 11-ish or whatever. I mean, he was whatever okay. is, like, extremely young to be 2,400. <laughs> right, right, right. That would yeah. qualify, I think. Yeah. So is he GM Wait, so now? Like, or? Must, who, can you say who it was? Is he, like, still a big chess person or not? I, really? I could, yeah. I mean, he's like, a, he's, like a, he's like a GM. He's still a chess person. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Good for him. Yeah. Anyway, I tried to get revenge on him once he was older, but I haven't yet. So I'm still ah. still hoping to beat him one day. There you go. Uh, there's a theory it might be uh, Sevian or Ali Reza. I don't think it was Ali Reza. No. <laughs> Ali Reza was 2400 for like three days. Like he yeah. was rising. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it was it was Nizhnik. He's the youngest player that I've lost to in a tournament, and he must have been about 11 at the time. Nizhnik. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. It was kind of like a, a low point for me. <laughs> but but I but I didn't take it like too badly. I I I was having like a bad time for other reasons as well that day, but um but I was like, oh he's so exuberant. What a cute kid, you know. <laughs> His FIDE profile picture, I think, was from like the day of that tournament, or maybe oh. even earlier. <laughs> it might be. Was Somebody was like, "David's having a bad day. I'm going to take a picture of this kid and like post it everywhere forever." <laughs> he looks like he's six, but he was born. No. Yeah. Oh, you, crazy you guys think Sevian? Sevian. Every everything I've seen from Sevian is he's very like calm. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't sound. No, like... there's the the famous video of him beating Greg Shahadi. 
Oh, that's why. Talk he was there. very energetic and excitable when he was like 10 or 11. But now, I mean, he's... Yeah. I think like a lot of these chess players like start out seeming maybe a little immature when they're like 10 or 11, like very emotional and excitable. You know, immature at 11. It's weird. But if they travel, (laughs) but then if they travel the world playing against like adults, like by the time they're 17 or 18, they're like extremely mature for like a 17 or 18 year old. Cause it's like, they've traveled the whole world. They've spent like a lot of time being treated like, Adults will have like a very respectful, normal conversation with like an 11 or 12 year old if they're 2400, right? Like <laughs> you, you just treat them like a person. They're like a professional yeah. equal. So these these kids, a lot of them mature That's pretty so fast. Because I mean, you wouldn't have that. You wouldn't have that in basically any other game or profession where you right. just have like these people like that are walking around at 12 and people are like, well, but, you certainly know what you're doing. I also <laughs> think about that when I when I see like chess players react. You must be an adult. <laughs> like, I mean, Jordan, like, Jordan Von Forest winning, like, right on Zay. Like, I I would, like, if I was Jordan Van Forest, I feel like I would just be, like, losing my mind with exuberance after that moment. Mm-hmm. Like, like you see, like, tennis players after they win Wimbledon, right? They yeah. throw their rag in the air. And test chess players don't do that. <laughs> no. No. Yeah. They only throw chairs when they lose. Yeah. And it's their own. Now, somebody like Federer, who's won like a million Grand Slams, when he wins the Grand Slams, does he still throw his racket and cry? Or is he just like, whatever, did it again? No, no, he's still not. That's what I thought, too. I feel like I once saw him just completely break down. And I was like, dude, it's your 13th title. Everyone knew you were going to win it. Right. No, no, no. Every time. Yeah, you can watch. I think um, there's probably a YouTube video of like every, every every match point from Federer Grand Slams and he always yeah. falls to his knees and like <laughs> <laughs> and you're like it was 6-2 six, 6-2 two, six, two already in the first two sets like where's the surprise here <laughs> yeah. I think that's why they created those uh, chess chairs that they had at the last uh, the, at the candidates because those things were so big there was no way anybody was going to throw those things well, what was the deal did they like have to bring their own chairs did the tournament not no, have no, chairs no, those green yeah. chairs or a lot of them had those green chairs right like, they had the like, green like, chairs but then, was in that chair, and then like there was but then like, some people ones. had their like yeah they were chair. just like screw this I'm going to go find one from the local library and just bring this one <laughs> in here like <laughs> it's what Ever. It just whenever, was weird to me. Whenever the I world's look at biggest Grishuk, tournament. Whenever I look at Grishuk, I just imagine that he should have like brought like a metal folding chair and a pack of cigarettes. Like just every time I look at Grishuk, I'm like, I don't, I don't believe that this guy's like bed has as much padding as the chair that he has. Yeah. <laughs> I can completely imagine Grishuk. that. That's so perfect. Yeah, I could get behind. Oh man. I like, like Grishuk. Yeah, I like Grishek a lot. I've always, I've like, I've, I've never known like, like, oh, what players game should I say? Like, who, who should I play like, or like? Mm-hmm. Oh no, I see. Like but I think players. from personality, what I think, like, I think, however Grishek plays, I think yeah. I should just get behind that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I identify just from as a Grishuk. personality standpoint. Yeah, especially I, on your current I, self-deprecatory binge. Yeah, the other day what was his quote he said like, like it's true that to lose to me someone has to like play yeah, really yeah. quite badly he must have played badly if he lost to me right? yeah <laughs> exactly. can, we, can we can we pick up can we pick up grishik as our like as our like class hero like if that's a thing like, yeah, it gets around grishik's that's really good um, <laughs> no, you're gonna take grishik yeah. well yeah oh, i like grishik man. i like i like gary too personality wise but I still yeah. agree. Uh, yeah. Well, then, if you if you've got if you've got like some debating to do, I don't. Yeah. I felt really bad for Wayne Howe. If you guys saw his uh, retirement announcement in like a post game interview, like that Whoa. guy just looked like he hated chess. Felt really bad for him. Wait, so he just retired right after? Like he's just like I'm not like. Oh man. I, think, I don't weird. know. I don't know. I, I it's sometimes it's hard to judge people on their their affect. That's just sometimes they just have resting miserable face but like also um, i mean like right after candidates it's just sort of a thing right there well i think i think he just i think he just has he was just having health problems i think he he had a very 
specific reason for not wanting to do this to himself anymore it's very very hard to play at like a sort of peak level if you're having some kind of physical problems even though chess seems to be in your head um i i had a tournament where like i like just sort of had my neck in an awkward position on the flight to the tournament and like the whole tournament was hell like it's just like the tiniest little thing i was like i like i couldn't play like the tournament <laughs> so um so you wouldn't have played uh prone like laid on the um like tony miles on the... so i basically like i couldn't sit for longer than an hour after that because it like hurt my neck into like my back and so like i played like winning quickly style like just trying to like throw everything like from the first moves and then i sort of like like limped around after the first hour was over for the rest of the round and like sat down rarely and yeah i couldn't sleep at night it was just it got worse every day yeah that's no fun yeah so i can imagine if you've got some kind of like health problem that tells you that every tournament's going to be like that <laughs> you know it's like no thanks find another way i think it's very clear he still loves chess and wants to do some chess related things and as to his personality um he's definitely like a very like happy positive person so yeah i you know he doesn't normally look sad yeah what happened what happened with ding Loren? i just don't understand that like he's number three in the world and he just so, like so. yeah well he won his last three games so he, he, oh he, i guess i missed that like i, yeah. I kind of like finished out like i was done watching after like it was pretty clear where things just were going so, he did he won the last three huh yeah okay and, and honestly right. i think the first i think it was really i think it was really the first half of the tournament that did him even like his his games even though he wasn't getting like the results like, like the three straight wins at the end he got okay. i think he was i think he was playing fine i think he was playing like, he was like for second himself. he was like second to he was just so far back one, yeah he was just point, so far it back. was like dang man i dude. think covid was putting a lot of added pressure on specific yeah thing in yeah. yeah especially like, with, because, oh, like the first time china was the first like, country to start like, elsewhere go with the COVID. yeah I mean, like, to be fair, right? Like, COVID started in China. So maybe mm. there's, like, actually an effect that, like, wow. Yeah. I mean, so if, if this tournament, to if this tournament had lasted... Before everybody else, and everybody else doesn't even know the trauma of COVID because they haven't already been through three months of it, and then the tournament starts in March. Yeah. Like, wow. Like, that, like, that is a real impact. Yeah. Another two and a half years, and he would have won the tournament if it kept going. <laughs> another 14 rounds in 2024 he would have been the challenger yeah, well, yeah, he yeah, has yeah. a he, Rajabob, like like comes in year. on year 3.2 he would like, he would replace Wang Hao because Wang Hao would have resigned <laughs> a year or two beforehand and, oh yeah. man there was a great our chess reddit post that i i think was tongue-in-cheek like i really hope so but on that subreddit you never know about a guy saying because halfway through wing how there was talk that he didn't even want to compete that rajabov should have taken over with wing house score and if they won <laughs> do like a round robin world championship or something with carlson yes Wait, so Rajabov gets Wong House score, which has nothing yeah, yeah, yeah. to do with Rajabov. But he's still, and then if he wins, he... He and Wang Hao both go to the championships. <laughs> and then they play hand and brain against Matt. Yeah, there you and go. He, and you know what's so dirty, too, is that, like, is that, like, Rajabov, like, in this tournament that was just going on, the NIC or whatever, that new in chess, mm -hmm. like, Rajabov was taking number one in that one, too, by the way. Like, like even over Magnus, I think, for a second, and then Magnus came came through and won it but it was like right. like Rajabov I think was like above Magnus well, for a little bit there in that tournament I thought I thought it was done no okay, never they have like they a prelim and then knockouts probably right yeah uh, he made the, really weird format. I think he made the not I was I haven't been watching that one like the others like I mean you know now like OTB's back we don't have to we don't have to suffer this 
online rabbit no, but yeah um, time zones are killer for OTP though hmm. yeah well, I, I want to go to. There's a Denver tournament in uh, mid June, and there's a Den and there's a tournament in Vegas, and so I'm kind of debating if I can make one of one or the other one as my first kind of like official chess tournament. So yeah. I don't know to do Denver, but I've never been to Vegas, and it's well, it's not that far from Denver. So I'm kind of thinking like maybe I'll maybe I'll do that trip, or maybe otherwise I'll just hang out and meet the Denver the Denver chess scene. So. Well, I'm hoping that Denver tournament is like also the start of them, like the Denver Chess Club, like doing its, like you know, monthly quads and all that stuff again. You know, yeah, maybe that might be the incentive to say, hey, maybe enough people are vaccinated and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm halfway through. I've had one, and I have my next one in mid-May. So nice. Excited for OTB. Yeah, for sure. Oh, right, David, you said you were thinking about Vegas, but probably not, right? Yeah. Thinking about it a little bit. It's not that far from you. No, it's, closer, it's not. It's closer, it's closer to you than it is to me. I've driven there for the National Open or the North American Open a few times. Yeah. yeah. Are there any, like, biggish tournaments in the Bay Area? Like, there are a bunch of the, the weekly ones, luckily, that are run through clubs. But... Yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing big. And post-COVID, I don't know exactly what there will be. But um, in the Bay Area, typically the biggest tournament would be the California State Championships in uh, Labor Day. First, okay. first three-day weekend in September. Um, that's typically the biggest tournament around here. It's not particularly big, but... Yeah. You guys have the mechanics chess club, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's a, like? I, that we don't. There's no I like mean, physical. There's no like try. physical chess club in the Denver. Is that that's not a physical chess? I thought mechanics was physical. No, it's I'm saying yeah. that is, but that's in San Francisco. I'm saying in Dem. We don't. There's not. There isn't one like that in Denver. No oh well yeah it's a church i think yeah know. exactly they meet like, at a yeah. church once. probably a church basement like yeah right yeah that's yeah. what most chess clubs do i mean if you're going to be right. open let's say four hours a week why why yeah, have a dedicated sure. space yeah i ran a chess club um in a school for a while and I think okay. that makes a good pairing because, like, we used it in the late afternoon and then evening and on weekends. So, yeah. In Ann Arbor, they had one for a long time. I was in a basement, and that's how I learned. Mm -hmm. And Ben Feingold, who is now a big streamer, was mm -hmm. a uh, was running it for a few years. Nice. So, got to meet him and his son. Through that, yeah. Kinda. yeah. So that, we that we we fun. were open like fifty sixty hours a week while sharing space, and wow. it, it, it still made sense to share fifty space. To sixty hours. Yeah, I mean, Dang. we were That's open. Impressive. We were open from like four p.m. to eleven on the five weekdays, and then we had a lot of weekend tournaments. So, wow, yeah. that's really cool. Yeah, that's cool. And like, you could almost just have like a like a stream out of there in the future you know after covid and it's just like here we are here's the chess yeah. club i mean it and had so some funny, things like, in st louis chess club i'm like how many people at in st louis chess club are actually in st louis like i don't know like you know yeah. is it either, how many of these streams are from the chess club i think that back in the day before covid there you could see they were like at lectures and they had like a like a you know like a screen in the back and there's students there and that was a neat way to do it but I don't know if they do anything out of that chess club directly at the moment. 
but it would be exciting to see in the future with everybody coming into chess through COVID and Queen's Gambit. Like, yeah. I mean, I'm definitely not going to go back to running a brick and mortar chess club myself, but um, I imagine that there will be like a pretty big resurgence of live mm-hmm. chess clubs. Um, if, if we do manage to sort of get out of COVIDs before variants spiral out of control or something, but. Or this is the rest of our lives. No, yeah. I'd, I'd love to see a brick and mortar here. And I'd love to see a brick and mortar here in Denver because there is none at all, you yeah. know? And so yeah. like to find one that was dedicated to that. It's a big and growing city with a lot of millennials. So. And th- I think the Aurora chess club, but sadly bit the dust oh, during COVID. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know about that one. Yeah, wow. Well, I, I only knew because I live in Aurora. And, yeah. But surely, you know, these things will be back. Yeah, um, hopefully. I mean, right, again, it wasn't a break. They met at the Aurora Library mostly and mm-hmm. stuff. And, yeah. yeah, so. Cool. Um, I want to invite anyone in chat who has a question about either lesson today to ask their questions, either the uh, 12 to 1400 or 14 to 1600 group, anything that that you saw or heard today that you've got any questions about, I would be happy to answer those. Yeah, I do know Kasparov played the Tarash for sure. Yeah, that's... kind of why i think i'm like kaspara played it how bad could it be? <laughs> um post 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 i have them all spending 50 percent of their time on playing games and then within the 50 percent of their time to study it uh sort of depends a little bit per player what they're doing but everybody has some amount of time on tactics some amount of time on analyzing their own games or themselves and some amount of time on one you know topic of interest should you wait to get better before joining a chess club i think in general waiting to get better before doing something is uh is not a a useful approach to it you'll probably get better by joining the chess club than by waiting to get better that actually reminds me of a point i was trying to or thinking about asking earlier and i didn't really get into i don't know what the value is in studying gm games at somebody at a much lower level and so that's kind of a curiosity point for me Mm -hmm. why Uh, is it like 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 isn't it better to just study somebody who's playing games at say 17 or 1800 and is there any value at looking at a gm game compared to your play like if if you were just to play a game and like look at somebody that was 300 points or 400 points higher is there any actual greater value to look at that gm game yeah the gm the gm game is going to be of higher quality so whether or not you understand it you're going to be seeing good moves it just i guess it just I seeps do, in. Like, like the thing is, that, like, like to be able to see like the negative and positive impacts of moves and to question them, like, because that's the thing with the GM, like a GM moves. I feel like it's harder at my level to question a GM move. Right. Like to go, like, did your move, like, oh, that was wrong. Like, do I feel like that's wrong? Do I feel like I'm honored enough to be able to make the decision that that move was inaccurate? You. you... And I can say that, or like. 
you know, and like, that's kind of the harder part. And so like, if it's eight, if it's 300 to 400 points higher, I can be like, okay, no, I'm actually fairly comfortable at like, like from myself being able to say that's wrong. Right. I mean, the fact is like at your level, most of your analysis is likely to be wrong. Like a very high percentage of my analysis is wrong if I try to analyze a game, right? So most of your analysis is likely to be wrong. And you may recall that when I was telling Falk about looking at like GM games in his openings, right? I told him like, you're not trying to analyze them. You're not trying to decide if they're right or wrong or what the key move was or something like that, right? You're just absorbing the game, right? You're just letting it seep in. So, so normally, I would have you just sort of like, um, just sort of play through GM games without trying to understand everything about them and just sort of absorb like the feeling and the shape of it. Now, Drit mm -hmm. enjoys wrestling with the games. So I said, go for it. Wrestle with the game if you like to do that, mm -hmm. you know? That's a fun way for him to engage with it. Um, GM games, GM games that... do have, oh, go ahead. Just to add on in case anyone, um, Drew or anyone in chat's interested, like, the reason I do it, and, like, I'm not trying to, like, let's say Black loses in a GM game, maybe, like, I try to find the point where Black lost, maybe I try to find this, that, or the other, but, like, the goal isn't even always, like, um, proving or disproving, it's just, like, what are the things that they're seeing that wasn't on my radar that then I can incorporate in my games? Um, to give like a concrete example, I remember going over this Bobby game. It was like in a Petrov and it looked really boring and drawn. And it's like a queenless middle game. And then all of a sudden he just plays like G4, restricting his opponent's pieces, gaining tempo, gaining space. And I probably would have just played like H6. The same idea of being like not back rank mated, but this idea that like, oh, that you can even play just like G4 in these types of positions because, oh yeah, I'm not really worried about being mated anymore, even though this doesn't feel like an end game. Like so just like little things like that, those small little kernels mm -hmm. is all I'm trying to get from the games. Hmm. Yeah. So similar question here from post, post, post saying, for players at the 1600 level or below, is there any difference between a GM or an IM game? Does it seep differently, right? I mean, in general, looking at higher quality games is just a bit better, just a bit better. Um, now, from like a 1600 perspective, you probably can't tell, tell the difference between an IM game and a GM game or a GM game and a super GM game. But you'll just be like seeing better moves if you look at, at GM games or super GM games. So that's that's the the advantage to doing that <clears throat> and um yeah uh michiko asks could a person spend too much time playing or studying chess do i recommend time off like mr tomato saying five minutes every half hour off um you know i have spent at times easily easily 80 to 100 hours a week um playing or studying chess and i don't think that was ever adverse for my chess it may have been adverse for other aspects of my life potentially you know maybe my social skills or something but uh as far as like chess studying chess can't hurt your chess i would say but some people might feel some kind of like burnout if they were studying that hard maybe they're forcing themselves to because they want to learn something i was doing it because i wanted to do it not like not even to get better just because i wanted to i had like a million things i wanted to study i wanted to look up this i wanted to look up that and everything that i learned in chess made me ask another question about chess right so if i'm like oh man, I wonder how Kasparov plays this knight or variation. Then I would like find his variation that he had played. And then I'd be like, I wonder what other people have done with that variation, you know? And I'd, then I'd like play through some of them. I'd be like, huh, does that end game with the knight actually favor the knight against the bishop? Let me try and find like 10 other end games with like 
a knight versus a bishop in this kind of situation. So like every single thing that I wanted to learn like led me to like more things that I wanted to learn. So I kept doing it. I don't think it ever hurt my chest. But I would say if anybody's feeling burned out, then then in any activity, um, it could make sense to take a little break somewhere. Elfins, if you're looking at the games of Talar al Yechin, it should not be suffering. It should be like a supreme joy. If it's suffering, then yeah, don't do it. How playable is the Stafford Gambit? Jesus, how many more questions about the Stafford Gambit am I going to field? It's not dubious, nor tricky. It loses. <laughs> so how playable is it? Not. Not. Learning what Just good like position. Just bong cloud. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it's like ask that same question, but substitute the bong cloud in your sentence. Lord. Wow. You're much, uh, you're much more hardline about it than uh, Kostya. I mean, Kostya also thinks it loses. Yeah. I mean, Kostya's being nicer to chat. Because <laughs> like, I um. It took like Kostya the... to make me seem like the bad guy. <laughs> um, I was thinking about like um, back to that like idea of like, uh, you know, lower rated players analyze or looking at GM games. And, um, like, how much you can get out of it. Like, sometimes I do, especially, like, when I'm, like, if I find a game in, like, that opening explorer or something, and I just can't help my, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it for the opening, but I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to look at this whole game while I'm here, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so sometimes, like, I like to do this thing, like, with a game that's above my, way, way above my level, mm -hmm. is, like, can I find, and it's a decisive game, I'm like, can I find the losing move? Mm -hmm. Is that is that like a useful exercise for players like us to do or no? I Trying mean, I... to find the losing move in a game is a really cool exercise. And you guys are just good enough where I would like have you start to do that kind of an exercise. But generally, it would be with a game of like the scope um, that um, Drew's going to find in, in, in his first chess book. Right, like in other miniatures. words, in other words, like a twenty-move game, it's like a little less yeah. like territory to cover, a little less overwhelming, and definitely before you try to, I'm not saying you're incapable of doing it with like a sixty-move Karpov Kasparov like Titanic right. struggle, but yeah. I am saying that if you're capable of doing it, you'd be much more capable of doing it after doing it with like three or four, um, you know, twenty-move games and sort of like right. building up that that skill or ability it's a very right. fun thing to hunt for the losing move yeah in a game or just like, like and then just like or just be like where does it where is it going you know I, and a lot of times it's also just like why is this like why why is this game going bad and like when is it going bad you know and mm -hmm. for one player and so, and that's sin, right? That's what it is. Right. And you <laughs> but then, and then you're just like, just like yeah, and then at some point you right, and then like you kind of work backwards cuz then you if you find the winning idea, then you're like <laughs> then you try to work backwards from that, you know. Okay, what well, what did they need to do to stop that from happening? Yeah. On I'm the question about Vegas. on oh, the wow. question about being able to study too much, Chili Buttons makes a good point they feel like um, you can reach a point in a day where you've made so much effort you can't really process much more or learn much more, right? I agree. Very plausible. I continued studying past that point because I wanted to, not because I was going to get better from doing it, not because I was going to remember it necessarily, because I wanted to do it, right? When somebody watches one more episode of a Netflix show... It's not because it improves them. It's because they wanted to do it. And it was the same for me with studying one more chess game and one more chess game. Wait, so you like literally know at some point you're not going to take in any more information? I mean, like, I mean you like, don't necessarily you like know for sure, but you may start to feel some kind of like brain fatigue. I mean, I remember that in school. Like, I think that's yeah. beyond chess. Like, you yeah. Oh, yeah. probably felt it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Every day, every day, every day, somebody comes into Seth's class. He looks at that kid and said, "This kid's already done for today. Like they're oh, not yeah, going to get yeah. anything more today." 
the structure of school is so weird anyways it's just like i've always been a fan of these one course at a time programs whereas <laughs> like you know yeah. you can just study something for a while and then another because like having six different classes in a day is insane i just Man. like that's my personal opinion about education like why do people take six classes in one day like i, I what is your brain gonna do with that fun. like and I, I can see it actually a lot more with like teaching sixth graders. I can see the moment it's like where they're like engaged, they're interacting with me. And then I'm just sort of talking and they're just like, mm. and I'm like, remember <laughs> when you were answering my questions 30 seconds ago, can we bring that back? And they're like, nah, we're, we're, we're tapped out of this one. <laughs> Whereas like in high school, I felt like they were just, they had just like, were always tuning me out no matter what so it didn't matter but like in middle school you can see the brain drain happening like on them they're like <laughs> it's not even it's not even an intentional decision it's oh just no like, no no absolutely like my not. brain my brain just don't like it's I've like five classes it's like, today I, like, right it's like i went to i've gone too far they they are they cannot take any more <laughs> I wonder if they have like a study about like where classes are placed placed in the day and for students like like if you had like your first few classes of the day like we're always like math classes whether you turn out to be an engineer and then like but if you if you had your first like your second period was always like an art class then you'd turn out to be like some you know an artist and they'd just be like yep see we told you <laughs> like sixth period doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Seth, here's my idea for ramp revamping education. Yeah. Okay. I think they should have more recess and a longer school day, but with like lots of like social time for the kids built in. I agree with the social time. I don't know about longer school day, but yeah. Um, yeah, Is no. Less learning and more running around. No, well, I like don't basically, know. I... basically extend it from like three fifteen or three thirty, whatever it might be, uh -huh. till five. But then just add in like all that extra time as like breaks during the day for the kids to socialize. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think. And then just, yeah, I mean, I felt that I remember last year, the school I taught at that high school, um, like like now we teach um, I teach. Well, it's this year is, you know, so weird. But uh, but we have like we have kids for blocks like they have. They have, they have like a 90 minute block of math every day right and so you can't just like teach straight 90 minutes of math to sixth graders every day so um like we take a 10 minute break like my classroom is a mobile classroom like you know so it's like outside of the building anyway but other teachers do like we just take like 10 minutes in the middle of class and then go outside mm -hmm. um and uh so and then like yeah, and just extend lunch. But I remember it, in the high school last year, I'm like, this day is long, and and like like the and like I feel like they were like trying to squeeze out like every minute they could into the classes, and they like squeeze it from every little place. Like lunch was short. Like lunch was short for me. Like I'm like I need more time at lunch to decompress, and I'm an adult, and it's like so the kids, and it's like the kids, and it's, they have like, and they have more social needs too. And yeah. it's just like, if their social needs aren't going, if they can't meet their social needs in the areas that where it's appropriate, they're going to meet them anyway, just like in your classroom when you're trying to teach them. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. what they need is more social time. I mean. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because I remember like lunch was like 30 minutes and I'm like, yeah. you Whoa. know, and then. Yeah, and it was like it was like thirty minutes, and classes were all there were fifty-eight minute periods, so they had seven fifty-eight minute periods in a thirty-minute. You know, it's like, wow. Yeah, it was yeah. ridiculous, and it was a, and it, it and they do this at schools that you know because they're like they do that in schools like the ones I teach in that are considered you know that um are uh you know they're always worried about like uh you know test scores and the amount of kids that they have are that are like below proficiencies and because they're you know in this era where like if you don't get your test scores up you get like closed by the state you know and so it's like <laughs> uh yeah so this is what they do to the kids to try to get the test scores up yeah 
Yeah, my school, I think lunch was like 33 minutes and um, recess was like 11 or 12 minutes. But when you see that, it's like, so you, so you started with like 15 minutes and you tried to like take one or two minutes away here and there, right? Your lunch might have started at 35 or 40 minutes and you exactly. took one minute off at a time to try and like add to some like period. And, and like from a teacher perspective, like you can test this, like, right? Like if my periods were 55 minutes instead of 58 minutes, it, it doesn't affect the lesson plan at all. It's like, it, there's no, right? It doesn't matter those three minutes but like those three minutes got wasted on me you know like dealing with some nonsense or whatever or like some you know somebody called me and i needed to send a kid to the you know something some there's three minutes wasted in every class like no problem like yeah easily so even even in even in the even in the most like well plan thoroughly uh and regimented classroom so it's like the idea that like uh you know like you couldn't give so like if you gave two minutes per class that seven period that's you know you gave you gave them 14 minutes or 15 extra minutes at lunch like that would that that would somehow affect learning would be detrimental to learning in any way it's like preposterous yeah i don't know My only teaching experience was like to undergrad as a TA when I was in grad school. So it's a very different experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although that was interesting because I, the courses I, I TA, one was like a grad level seminar. So it's like a bunch of other nerds who really want to be there. And then the other one I TA was, um, like an intro level general science course for non majors. So it's like people who are English majors that needed to take a science class to like get it over with. And that was an interesting experience. Yeah. I used to, I, as a part time job, when I was getting my teaching license, I, I helped teach the classes. They're like, they were like, it was like the math class that other teachers had to take that weren't the other non-math teachers had to take. And it was really funny, like some of their, just seeing like their attitudes towards math in general. But like, it's like, come on, you're, you're supposed, you guys are gonna be educators and you have like this whole, totally horrible view of this entire aspect of education. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed TA in physics. That was a good time. Oh. The, the like, just like working through those problems again one more time and get that those accelerations down. Yeah. For sure. But yeah, yeah, it's it's engaging too. Like freshmen in college are definitely like, let's go. They sell the energy. <laughs> it's yeah. It's interesting. Um teaching the, the freshman level for non-major because the math that we were essentially teaching, like dimensional analysis, canceling out units and multiplying numbers together, it's like you kind of see the disparity of like who had what high school education where some people are like, sure, I'm an English major, but like you <laughs> learned this. <laughs> yeah and yeah. for other people who like really they it's the first time seeing it and they have to come to all the office hours and it's just yeah. and none of them are like it's clearly not an intelligence thing because like the people who don't know it like they learn yeah. it but it's just like interesting what people have been exposed to and not yeah well the other class i i would i would help um teach was uh was college algebra which is actually a fascinating class because apparently college algebra is like the most flunked college course in the country and you think <laughs> and it's wow. yeah and it's and i and actually looking back on it i i can see why because it's terrible and like they kind of would force all these freshmen to come in and take it um not all of them some would like test you know accu place out of it or whatever but like it was either 
completely ridiculous and unnecessary and you didn't need to be in this class, but you just were anyway. Or it was, or you struggled or you didn't know other stuff and it was way too much information for anyone to possibly learn well in a semester. And that's why, and I'm like, so yeah, it totally makes sense that this class is, that people fail this class all the time. And it's you like, it's, it's like not college level math, it, but it's like all the high school level math and like kind of the harder high school algebra. But you know, it's like, usually that's like a year and a half or two years of high school math. And like, here it is in one semester. And if you don't have the, and if you don't have, if you have the foundation for it, it's easy. And if you don't have the foundation for it, it's like such a hard class. I'm kind of fascinated by the point that like chat and this discussion and the like all of us like it's like not changed like the person out like it's like the same people are like in chat and like chatting and like it's it's kind of interesting how everybody's yeah. just transitioned into this new discussion on a completely non chess related topic and just Seth, like, <laughs> Seth if you want to argue with someone in chat metabolic error is saying uh Wait, wow, he, now he's saying he agrees with you? He says that math is under-regulated. The teaching of math is under-regulated. Under-regulated. I don't even, I don't, I don't know what he means by that. <laughs> on something else. Under-regulated? What is that? In like what that, way? There should be more <laughs> top-down government direction of how we test and drill math to students. Oh, yeah, that's... We need we need more we need more we need more, more people testing. that don't know what they're talking about telling the people that do what to do. That's what that's what that's what <laughs> I that like math as a puzzle. I mean, good. is it isn't Common Core like just a like a standard now? Like, <laughs> I don't know. It seems like it's not, not a regulation, I guess. Sure. But, but it is there, it, I don't know if it's your words or not, but Com it's your, it's your Common Core. Well, Common Core isn't the problem. It's it's the implementation of policies around it that is, basically. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair around enough. around all standards and and the way we assess standards and what we consider rigorous and 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 how we measure that and whether the measure itself is actually rigorous or just you know. Uh, uh, a measure for measure's sake, but yet we, and yet we base all everything on education on these on these measurements. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's that's education. Talk. Glad we solved education. <laughs> that's education. Yeah. No. no. <laughs> David, one thing I'm curious about from your perspective, because you've obviously you've been a teacher. Yeah. What's the biggest difference between teaching kids and teaching adults? I mean, adults you've taught mm. chess, but like I think it's it must be somewhat similar. Right. Um, there's there's several differences. Um. often adults have more of a motivation that like fits into sort of like an established, I don't know, it like fits into their whole life in a way, right? Like they know what something means to them and like they have some perspective on, on what it's going to matter and what they're, what they're giving up to, to learn something and what it costs to learn something and all that. And so they'll tend to be pretty invested um, and motivated. Um, whereas motivation, I think, varies like really dramatically among like kids. There will be kids who are just like obsessed with something and kids who just like don't understand at all why it's interesting yet. Yeah. Oh. Um. So that's like, that's one thing. And then also just that like kids don't have that perspective of like how it fits into other things, right? So you could teach like a kid like how to, how to figure out 15% of something. Simple 
thing you might learn in, I don't know, third or fourth grade. Um, you teach them how to figure out 15% of something and like a kid will be like, well, why, where would I ever use that? You know? <laughs> and like, that's like a joke to an adult, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. But a kid will be like, how is this ever relevant to me? I'm never going to do this, you know? Um, so I think, I think that's like a big piece that like, you know, adults really know how things like fit in and why they might want to like learn the things they want to learn. Um, kids tend to be more optimistic in general and adults less so. So kids won't like, I mean, I mean, it's a tragic thing that some kids do learn to like think of themselves as being limited various ways, like as kids, but a lot of kids don't yet feel like very limited. They feel like if there's something they don't know, like they could learn it. Whereas like a lot of adults Mm. have stopped learning new things and believe that the set of things they currently know and the set of skills they currently have is like their skill set immutably for their life. Right? Like a lot, like if somebody, like we've got some engineer in chat, like they believe that like they've got the skills to be an engineer and not to be like a poet. And I might think like I'm, you know, 39 and I'm not an engineer, I will never be an engineer. Like impossible. Done, right? Um kids don't tend to have that as much. Like they're they're a lot more flexible about what they believe they can learn. And that's part of the reason why people like think like kids can learn new things more easily than adults is because like the kids themselves believe they can learn. So the learning and adults are like, it's too late for me. I mean, how many expressions about like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks are there in the language, right? I mean, like people just start to have a very set view of themselves, which then causes them to become pretty set. <laughs> um, and... Another thing is like if a kid is like passionate about something, they'll put like a hundred hours into it and like an adult won't because they're they've got other responsibilities and they're tired. Right? Yeah. Like you guys are pretty like pretty like passionate about chess. Mm-hmm. Um, on a scale of like, you know, people who are interested in things. Um right? I mean you can just see I mean, everybody here like knows you guys because you're like doing chess stuff all the time. They see it, right? And then when I ask you like how many hours you're studying, it's like, oh, maybe like 15 hours a week, right? Like me when I was 15, it was like, oh, I don't know how many hours are there in a day times seven, you know? It was like, it's like, it's like incomparable, you know, the, the hours that I put in to chess when I was in high school right? There's no way you guys could ever, there's like, there's no adults that do that almost. Right. Uh, um, yeah. I, I even, I'm all, I, I'm like even ashamed to admit how many hours I do spend just because like, I know I'm an adult with like adult responsibilities. Right. It's just like, you're like, you gotta be practical about these things. Right. Like one of the main things my chess teacher did for me was like select books for me to read. Right. He had like a great like library of chess books himself and a great knowledge of chess literature. Like he'd read more chess books than I have. So he was better at like giving books to me than I would be now at giving books to my students. Much better. And so we would like see each other and I would borrow like three books from him and I would give them back to him the next week and he would give me more books. So like how long is it going to take Falk to read Yusupov? Right. Yeah, like a, a while, right? Like a month or two. Like a month or two. I didn't spend a month or two on a book. <laughs> you give it back next week. So that's like a big, big difference right Dang. there as well. Right? That that as I said, kids' motivation like varies a lot, but when you get the really motivated kid, like they've got no <laughs> they've got like no responsibilities in general. <laughs> so they can just like go crazy with it and so that's why you also get like extreme cases of kids improving really rapidly or dramatically at something right 
Like if you look at what Ali Reza did in chess, or if you look at like, you know, like Nizhnik being like 2,400 feet at 11 and like a GM at, I don't know, 13 or whatever, right? Like if you look at that, like when I have like an adult student come to me and they're like so like pumped about chess, like I still don't expect them to become 2,400 feet in two years. Like I basically know they won't. <laughs> right yeah so i wonder what i wonder what chess latte's uh books per week rate is at this point for chess right if you if you started sending chess latte like chess books <laughs> right we just know he would go through them faster than us right yeah i've been reading i've been reading night end games by Averbach for eight months now Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know and jesse's like oh no david you're gonna become a gm one day no <laughs> not like eight months to read three or four chapters no yeah, yeah. i mean it's so but critical about the right end games in that particular set i mean that's so huge anyways right like i don't know that's such an important topic if you if you get through that book if i get through that book it might it might help me some yeah but at the same time i'm forgetting other stuff you know like i mean yeah i would probably have to be like working harder now than i worked before <laughs> right so. right right the 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 jump the jump the jump it would take to get to gm is probably the hardest jump of all the ones you've already made right yeah And in a sense, I was like not so far away from it when I quit. Yeah. You know, when I quit, I was probably like one more year away of like full time chess. Mm -hmm. So you you could have been GM if you didn't quit. I would did, think like, so. I mean, I was able to make the norms, and you know, my rating at its highest was about like twenty four thirty eight or t something like that. So it was like reasonable and. You know, there were like one or two really like high impact like weaknesses that I could have worked on. So what's Cry what's Cry's story then though, right? Because like You mean why does he say that I'm gonna be a GM? <laughs> no, 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 not about you, just about him. Just about him? How did he become a GM? He got through and did like a full a PhD in philosophy and yeah. did all this other stuff with his yeah, life. So obviously he wasn't work obviously like he wasn't completely focused on chess throughout his life so yeah. like you know he was able to accomplish this gm and still get a phd in another yeah. an entirely different field yeah i, I mean, mean he got his phd too, i guess but he like, got his whatever. phd in germany so it may have been may have been slightly different than in the u.s but i think that at that point he wasn't even an im i think he was probably like you know, like a 2300 kind of player and came back oh, to so the U.S. GM late and became IM late and GM late, really? relatively speaking. Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So he's like an inspiration. Yeah. Okay. Inspiration for us. There's still a chance. Yeah. 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 Get some, get some cry, get I some cry work in there. Need a so wait, how does that story work with him then? I mean, for, for him to, followed that trajectory yeah i mean he, as i said he was I, he was already a good player i mean he was definitely like he was definitely a master like if like maybe close to i am okay i, I would i would guess um you know and he was playing in like leagues while he was in europe with mm -hmm. with other masters so he must have been like you know like fide master or something like that kind of level um and Jesse just like kept, you know, grinding and getting a little bit better and a little bit better, you know, and he worked on his games and he found like, since he worked so much on his own games, he could always find like effectively what is the next weakness of his own that he could work on. I mean, he obviously can answer this question much better than I can, but, mm -hmm. um, but like for me, for example, for a long time, I worked on my strengths the things that I enjoyed, right? So it's like I would study Tall's games and then I would study, 
you know, Kasparov's games. And then, um, you know, my strengths continued to be accentuated, but I wasn't like hitting like some of my main problems. Um, hitting your main problems is more like high yield in terms of your like performance payoff. But it's less fun. But it's less fun. And so working <laughs> on what was fun sustained my interest. You know, you can't say for sure that I would have done better if I'd if I'd worked the other way, because maybe it would have killed my interest and I would have spent, you know, 10 hours a week instead of 100. And then would that really be better? Um, you know, and with time, I started to develop a taste eventually for end games and, and other things. So, you know, I could have come around to it eventually. But never come around to a opening theory. Ah. <laughs> uh, uh, probably not probably not but i could have made gm without opening theory yeah i mean so like my like big weaknesses were in like patience and defense there's right. like the two biggest weaknesses and then also like in terms of like x's and o's would have been in like end games and studying end games and getting better at end games would have given me like more confidence to defend positions because i'd have some idea of like where are the scenarios where i can like hold on because if you're bad in the end game basically what happened was like i was bad in the end game and i'm faced with like defensive choices in the middle game of like suffering via a b or c and i couldn't judge which of the three sufferings was worse and not only that, like, I knew that, like, I was very rarely going to save a bad endgame against a GM. Like, if it's objectively a draw, but I have to play, like, great endgame moves into the sixth hour, like, I sort of knew that was, like, very unlikely for me, right? So it makes it hard to make the best choices about defense when you're sort of, like, headed down a slope of like you're just symbolically putting up the toughest defense you could all along to tell yourself that you tried really hard and you like worked for six hours and made them work for six hours but like you're just headed towards a loss the whole time um and i think with like better end game skills it might have also helped me to have like a better attitude about the defense you know that like the point of the defense was actually to save the game <laughs> not just to like fight really hard um, so I think I could have like worked on that and made it without opening theory. Although, I mean, the game was also changing at the same time. So like, you know, the, the posts may have moved, you know, maybe, maybe if it took me like, you know, a couple of years to get those skills that I, that I'm estimating I could have gotten another year, if it had taken me maybe three years, maybe the opening stuff would have overtaken by then and been a problem. I don't know. Although, so this is... I mean, this leads into a, a more general question too that I've had because I, whenever I hear higher level level players talk about whether or not you need opening theory positions, whether or not you need to calculate, mm -hmm. especially on the latter, I've noticed that there's this thing where it's like because uh, this happened with my old coach where he'd be like, oh, like just what are the good squares for your pieces? Like you shouldn't really need to calculate in this position. You don't want to waste time. I'd be like, okay, this. He's like, oh, well, no, because you didn't think of, like, this, that, and the other. And I'm like, it's not a tactical calculation, but it, it like, just to him, that's just, like, he's not calculating that. He sees yeah. that. Yeah. And for you, I, I wonder to what extent when you say you don't need opening theory, like, wh how are you defining opening theory? Because you definitely know more opening theory than anyone here. In this conversation. Yeah. 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 So, like, do you mean, like, the level of opening theory that most other GMs know you felt you didn't need to get right. to? Right. So, I mean, basically, <laughs> I never, like, deliberately studied opening theory okay. very much, right? That makes so, sense. like, what I learned, I learned kind of incidentally, right? So, if you study enough Kasparov games, like, you know a few moves of the Night Orf. Mm -hmm. Like, there's, like, it'd be hard, it would be hard not to know that after Bishop G5, like, you play E6, right? um like so, like to some extent that's like unavoidable right and you probably know that if you've seen like 20 night orf games right but once i've seen like 2000 night orf games like yeah. like i just <laughs> have to know a bit more right um yeah. without mm -hmm. having tried so i mean the thing is like you know so i also like i continually play different openings in order to keep learning new things about chess Whereas, like, at any point, if you want to maximize your short-term results, 
you just set a stable repertoire and like play it repeatedly so that you're like the most practiced and repeated in whatever your best opening is, right? Yeah. And so, then, you, then again, you do also have that story, right? About your first GM win. Yeah. Where you just, yeah, you were there, like, there well, are exceptions. I'm there are today. exceptions. <laughs> I'm playing D4 today. There are exceptions, but like, you know, I could have done a profile on myself wouldn't take like too much insight to know that like i play and know the night orf better than e4 e5 the french and the caro Khan. and i played all four of those just like rotating right so like i could have just played the night orf every single game you know on occasion when i've been playing blitz and i'm like mad that my rating's low i'll just play like the night orf a few games in a row like i know that i'll score more points that way Right. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just like, oh, that's lame. I just like trotted out the night orphan some moves I know and like won the game in the opening. <laughs> and then I'm like, you know, bored again and go play some other openings. Um, so so in terms of like opening theory, yeah, like I know a bunch of opening theory, but I was not ever playing like a very stable repertoire. Um, it. it wasn't like memorized lines. It was just whatever like I happened to have picked up. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So. So I don't know. I mean, like, yeah. So obviously, it's not like I deliberately didn't know opening theory, but I also didn't deliberately know it. So that that was my level, and and like the claim is that you know. I could have or should have helped myself at some point by learning opening theory if I wanted to, and, um, you know, Drew, knowing my my preferences is like but would you ever have been willing to do that right because studying end games i didn't do for a while because it wasn't my favorite but memorizing openings like i'm actually like almost like morally opposed to it's like it's removing like moves that you could think about during the game uh mm -hmm. in a way it's increasing draws it's just it's like beating it to death like i just wanted them to switch to chess 960 like a long long time ago you know maybe 10 to 15 years ago i was done with chess and wanted to play chess 960 so and, what and I, and I guess that's what i was trying to just to say there like fill yeah. in i'm not trying to like memorize theory here because i think that i am more akin to your style of play um in general i mm -hmm. just like know that i do worse in move six through 12 so i just need to get better there so it's not about yeah. line development more just like I just get overwhelmed by trying to calculate positions when there's all of the pieces on the board and nothing's been traded. <laughs> yeah, I don't have this problem. I, I don't feel nearly good enough to like possibly get bored playing an opening. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I could play the same opening every game. It doesn't. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't bother me. And it's true that playing it the same opening again and again, you do learn it deeper and better you keep learning new things you know yeah exactly but like there are sequences that i've that i've won like many many games with the same sequence right so at some point it's like kind mm -hmm. of lame like here i'll show you guys like a way i've won like 10 million games um 10 million nice. i'll just make a new but i feel like they they occur rarely enough that it's like kind of feeling you're like yeah, and this, okay, this yeah. you'll you'll judge for yourself. It goes like pretty far. Like here's like a night orf game that I've played, not ten million times, but a lot of times. So bishop g five, e six, f four, Polgayevsky. I love you, even though this opening is very bad for black. So a lot of people play queen f three here, which is just a bad move. Black puts the bishop opposite the queen, and now it's awkward for white um then people play bishop d3 knight bd7 and castle queen side and then queen b6 hitting the knight and it retreats and b4 and knight a4 and queen c6 and they lose the knight Bummer. so i've won games like this like probably 10 times in this exact position i mean that's just lame it's just lame it's not, i like like i don't get anything by doing this again right and i've won another like 30 or 40 games where people retreated this night seeing that it would be trapped here right and then i played a5 and they played like uh-oh uh-oh and then i sacked the pawn 
right? And it's like, okay, it's a little bit fun because I get to use like a new tactic to finish the game like occasionally from this position. There's some fa fun tactics you can use as black here. But it's still a little bit like, even as I'm doing it, I'm like, like if they just knew, like, I don't know. It's, <laughs> Do you ever like, they're picking up their queen, like not F3. It doesn't go to F3. I mean, it's always like, you know, blitz online or whatever. But oh, okay. I was thinking uh, like if you have the OTB, yeah. You know? In in OTB tournaments, I haven't had the same position fifty times, yeah. and in OTB tournaments, you know, I I play mostly against like, you know, good players who wouldn't like allow this to happen. But like <laughs> online, my my blitz rating is such that I run into a lot of people who don't really know like a lot of chess opening theory, but they've got some like you know speed chess skills or whatever, so their ratings high enough to play me, and it's just like it's just lame. So this wouldn't work against a GM. No. No. Yeah. no. I mean, I don't think Maybe. an IM has ever played this as white. It's just too bad, but. Maybe 100 year old Averbach. But even then, probably. I mean, Averbach knew what to do with the Knights, right? These Knights look terrible. Well, Averbach is <laughs> a great player, but like, I wonder what his rating would be now. He's. Yeah, but like playing something like this, like I just want to like apologize to my opponent. You know, <laughs> yeah, okay. it's like I'm sorry right. you played I some like it. normal developing moves that like were well intentioned, and they just sort of like happened to lose, and I didn't even have to think about it during the game. And like, mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> That's true. It's not like it's not like it's not like it's not even like punishing them for like horribly misplaying the opening no. or anything it's just they didn't know their theory they didn't even do a sin it's just this doesn't it doesn't work i mean if they were like you know really insightful they would see that queen f3 doesn't really make sense against bishop b7 and they might try to play some other move here but sorry out of curiosity are people really out of book that early in like whatever they do against the night or is like what you do is black yeah. really weird well, I mean, B5 is probably like the fifth most popular move in this position, uh, or fourth, or something like Bishop B7 and Queen B6 are the two most common moves. Then the next okay. two are Knight BD7 and Queen C7. So, and probably even Knight C6 might be as popular as B5. So it's at least the fifth most popular move, if not the sixth. And then, yeah. You know, and I can play all the other moves here too. Oh, why are they? Um, why are they? Why are they playing Queen F three rather than Bishop D three? Uh, on this move here. Yeah. Trying to castle queen oh, they're side. trying to castle queenside quickly. Okay. If you play Bishop D three, you cut off the defense of this knight, so the knight can get quickly challenged by a move like Queen B six. Now you have to play mm -hmm. a retreating move. Yeah. And you sort of get into like the back foot here a little bit okay um white kind of wants the queen out of the way to do this and there are some lines in the sicilian where you play queen d2 some where you play queen e2 some where you play queen f3 some side lines where you play queen d3 although they're never like the best line according to theory but you can play it and it's like a fine move and if you know it better than your opponent you can get a game so they're kind of like picking where to put the queen, but the most common is F3, and they just, like, plunk it there, and then the bishop comes here, and then, oops. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I guess, like, the first time you beat somebody with some, like, opening idea of yours, it's, like, super thrilling. I enjoy that. But when you've already, like, won the same game before, the thrill's gone for me. I've actually had that happen with a line in the Marshall where they play H3 instead of G3 and you sack the bishop. Yeah. And, like, I've won blitz games, like, five times in the same line with, like, right. five seconds off my clock, which right. is just funny because, like, no one at my level plays much theory, so the odds that you get five exact, like, 15 move games is kind of funny. Right. And probably, like, the first couple times it's super exciting. 
Yeah, yeah. The first time it took me a while to find. And then over time, probably the joy like decreases a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm starting to learn that like the Vienna is is super dangerous at this at, at my level. It's just like it's so ridiculous. You and your BFF Gotham, man. Yeah. I I'm just it trying is, to. Though. It's it's learn. tough to play against. It's such ridiculousness. Yeah, I'm. I, I've never faced it. Well, yeah, because you always play Sicilian. You never Correct. play E five. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you play E five? Why? <laughs> there's no. There's like. There's like other openings I want to try, but I, I have no. I have no desire to ever deviate from the Sicilian. Although I know I should, but. Wow. I mean, you could you could at least play like Carol Khan or something. Or no. wait, why do you have to deviate? I don't know. Sicilian's the best. If 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 Black would always play Sicilian, I would play E four. You know, it's like wow, really loves the Sicilian. Yeah, it's interesting because I love when people play the Sicilian when I play E four, and exactly. because of that, I don't want to play it as Black. I, I I. Because I, I love it, because I think I'm going to beat it every time. I kind of chose... That's kind of why I played the Sicilian in the first place. And I'm like, well, they played E4. They want to play... They have some line they like in the E4, E5, so you get Sicilian. But, um, you know, that was my beginner logic. Now, it, it's like now I know that Sicilian, like, as you move up, Sicilian's more popular than E5, probably. But, uh, mm, um, yeah. Yeah, if it's not, it, I don't like closed Sicilians. Get out of here. That's no fun for either side. But uh, uh, open Sicilian, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Closed Sicilian actually, there's some can be can be okay. But yeah, yeah. I but just like like, the... like if Black would always play the Night Orf, like that would be fun. I would play. I would be down for that. If I, oh yeah. I mean, I love E4. Yeah. It's always fun to look through your own game explorer and see the games, like the openings that you play really well against. Mm -hmm. Do you do that ever? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember it was funny. Opening tree. I, yeah, because I think I was doing, like, I remember thinking, like, QGD, like that's my opening. Like, give me Queen's Game at the client all day. That's the opening I play the best. And then I was like, looked at my score on it and went, I'm like, yeah, actually, I, I, can't, I really want. But I think it doesn't matter because, like, I do get good positions out of the opening. And it just doesn't matter. For a while, I was winning more with black than I was with white. <laughs> so it's like, wow. You could try playing C4 with white, <clears throat> try to get more Sicilians that way. Play C four with white. Mm -hmm. Then so like I play E five reverse Sicilian. Tempo up Sicilian. Reverse Sicilian. Ah, interesting. But then you also have to get prepared for all the like symmetrical stuff against it. But then that's kind of like a lot of D four D five. But then I could just transpose to the D four stuff. Kind not full transpose, but like similar in spirit. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I like that it's it's like I like that it you can you can like fight for the center with a pawn in like a non symmetrical way. I, I guess maybe is if I was to put words to why you like I don't I don't like fight like I like putting a pawn in the center or fighting for the center on move one, but I don't you know, but like I don't like playing, <laughs> but there's no good way to do that. Like against D4, I play D5, even though I don't have a, 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 a opening that I enjoy playing in D4, D5 as black. So. Yeah, I shouldn't, I mean, my, my, my reasons for playing my openings is mostly that I just, that I just started playing them and I've stuck with them. <laughs> That's mostly yeah, what crazy. happened. I think I watched like some videos on like how like like how should I start my games? And then like one was like King's Gambit. 
and I just got house. And I was like, nah, not that one. And like other other aggressive, like aggressive but more solid Queen's Gambit. And I'm like, okay, that one. <laughs> I just always look through the opening book and see what looks like catches my eye. That's how I started playing that weird like uh, F three fantasy against the Caro. Mm. I was like, who the hell could play F three here? And I'm like, oh, this looks fun. Yeah. I just pulled up my opening tree and I was looking at my D four. I've only played D four eighteen times on Chess.com. What are your Never. results? Uh, terrible. I've only won five times. Well, <laughs> no draws. So the rest were all losses. Five, five out of 18. Yeah. Here's an answer for your question, Random. <laughs> it's basically only because of one line. It's because of white castling queenside and then using the G6 pawn as a hook to open a file for their rook on the king side that g6 pawn being advanced that's the reason why this opening fell under a cloud like 55 years ago and it's still there yeah it's a big cloud browser variation yeah would enjoy that with white oh uh lafon was playing people online today and i got another game against him 5 0 straight up, got another winning position and lost it again. Ah. I got it back on the gauntlet, I need another try. <laughs> yeah, you, you do, like, you killed, you were doing real well against LaFong there for a I, while. I'm, like, so disappointed. He in will that. be like, back. He did elect, he did elect to have a repeat appearance. <laughs> so. I'm, like, a very competitive person. Yeah, so. what if we just bring J yeah. Driven back against LaFong just because? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, it will be LaFong. Your round one opponent is Dritman. Your round two opponent is Dritman. Your round three. You just have to keep playing Dritman until he beats you because that's. I'll, I'll, like, I'll like put on. Because my chess comm, I think, is like Dritman 13. I'll be like Dritman 14. Yeah. <laughs> you like reach <laughs> over, put on a hat. <laughs> yeah, a little, a little mustache and glasses. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um. If yeah, White castles was... kingside when you play the dragon, then there's nothing wrong with the dragon, HP Bob Dole. Has anyone ever castled queen's kingside? Well, unless they, unless you play like the right. What if you play like the accelerated dragon and they get like the Maroxy set up? Mm -hmm. That's kind of bad for Black too, isn't it? Okay. I don't know. I think it's probably okay. Not unplayable. It may not be exactly the kind of position Black wanted, but I think objectively it's pretty much okay. Yes, Charlie played a hyper accelerated dragon monster. Yeah, the hyper. And I and I and I and I played a Maroxy. Yeah. The modern the defense dream. might one day be called the ultra hyper accelerated dragon. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's the fastest you could play one G six, right? You think Spyro would get jealous? Yeah, Drew, you did that to me on Tuesday when we were playing Sin, and I was like, "Is there something I should be doing other than King's Indian against this, or do we just transfer like pose the King's Indian?" Because yeah, I played D four and you just played G six. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'm like that doesn't seem very combative, but. I guess if I'm just going to play E4, then C4, then that, and you're, we're just going to go into a King's Indian anyway. It's why the King's Indian is so counterintuitive to me, because you just throw it away. It's like the setup I go for against somebody who doesn't fight for the center at all is the same setup you get when you play against someone playing the King's Indian. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but, like, the King's Indian is still good somehow. It doesn't make no. it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Wait, you know... David says King's Dude, Indian is no, yeah. good. But I mean, you know, there King's are super Indian GMs is not playing good. it. There are GMs playing it, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I feel sure. like a lot of people talk it up enough, and it's not Gotham this time. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. 
I just like I think it's fascinating because it's just completely ignoring the center. It's cool. Like it's just like everybody does the center stuff, but I'm gonna just hang out on my side of the board and something's gonna work out my way, I guess. <laughs> I think you I think you it's just just like I guess preparing the count the counter attack to it or something. Yeah. It's just like it's just like it's just like come at me and I'm gonna counter attack you. Yeah. I mean usually black quickly plays either E five or C five. Right. But when I play, when I played E five that was a total blunder as far as I remember. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't quickly, I guess. It was like moving. Normally play... normally there's a white pawn on E four. So if your opponent takes twice on e5, you can play knight takes e4 mm -hmm. and win back your pawn because the bishop on g7 attacks the knight on e5. But since your opponent's pawn was on e3, e5 was losing a pawn. You could have prepared it by playing knight c6 first. Yeah. Sometimes people lose a pawn to me playing e5 because I play the, the Averbach variation. And you get the and so even though their knight is pinned <laughs> with the bishop right. on g five, they still play e five. Yeah, <laughs> and then you, and then that either loses like a pawn or an exchange or a piece, depending on you know how how badly they mangle it from there. Right. So there's this poll. There's this poll in chat right now. Like, how much do you know about openings? I it made me think. Like, do you guys have your own like? fake theory variations of like things that get played against you all the time that isn't theory but like you've developed your own system because this happens to me because i play scotch all the time and so many people take the knight on d4 and so like i have an entire opening system that's i feel like i could write a theory book about about just like how best to punish it how best <laughs> yeah so, like, so remember, David, you were, I don't even know if it was from a Scotch or a Philidor, but there was some position that you were yeah. analyzing. Yeah. A postmortem. Mm -hmm. And White Castle, Queenside. Yeah. And there was all these questions about what order to push the pawns. Yeah. Or, like, when to ever take. And, and you're like, like, this is all in my book. <laughs> like, like, I'm like, I could write a book on, on how it's. Because we're like, oh, wow, like, White doesn't even need to, like, take anything. It's just black pieces will never move. I'm like, yeah. Totally. Like, those are my favorite games to win. They're, the, like, the most fun for me. So. Anyways. I'm just curious. Like, do you guys have that? Just because, like, at our level, sometimes people just always play the same weird stuff. Sometimes. Maybe partially. Like, I had a... I, I tried the Sicilian for a bit, like, a month. Or, I mean, not even that, but... I never got the open Sicilian, which I like learned the lines for. <laughs> I played uh, but it, every game was like e4, and I played c5. They bring the knight up to f3, and then I did some like oftentimes right. knight c6, and then they always play like some other move that's not um, not e5, which I know the theory of. <laughs> and then it's like I have to come up with something else, like cramming theory on the queen's gambit, and then you get fifty Londons in a row. <laughs> yeah, something like this. I <laughs> That's so oh. tricky. Like, I think practice is really important because going into the pool is stupid if you just spend an entire amount of time trying to figure out something and then it's like, yeah, and then you're just like, okay, whatever. Well, like, the, London, the London was like a lot more popular like three months ago for some reason. Somehow, I swear to God. Uh, now, now it's like, it's like, because I, when people would play D four, I would be like, okay. For a while, it was like, oh my god, a London. And maybe it was, maybe it's the has to do with more of the rating level than the, than the popularity. But and then I, I remember playing a like like trying to look at an opponent for a classical games opening tree, and like I'm like trying to see what they play as black against D four, and all their black games are against Londons, and I'm like, oh, it's like D four. Like they play the ends, like, and then what do they play? Oh no, the person plays bishop f4. <laughs> Useless. Yeah. yeah, I wanna, I wanna, I, if I go back and study like 
anti-London stuff. I want to look at like uh, just play C five. Whatever it is to make them play C4, because then I can really challenge them, because I think that a lot of London players just want to play C3, because they're like, that's what a London looks like. It's a triangle. Just play (laughs) C5, and they'll be like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, you're fighting back. Yeah. And then it's like, because I feel like there's like an innate sense, like it's supposed to be easy. So I make my triangle and everything's fine. (laughs) But why don't I do other things? London? I feel like that's not like just copying the London then. Doesn't feel like the best way. To... Sorry, I'm reading chat. Bishop F5. Uh, no, that's a way of playing. That's a way of playing. We were talking about we were like, talking I mean, about C5. Do, like, you can copy the moves. I don't know. I don't. I don't ever really play against. Yeah, like, but then, but like, then it's like I think. It, I think the idea is that like black's position is then just as good as white's, and white just forfeited being white basically is my understanding my, oh yeah so, i could be wrong about that but ufo made a comment about the only thing he hates more than the london is the rubenstein french which as a 1e4 player i completely agree love playing against the french and the rubenstein is just super boring mm-hmm. it's like you're just slightly better for a long time i just think the, the winner is always interesting right winners uh, Steinitz. Menchik, Menchik David beat it today in that um, game that we started watching this morning. Yeah, no. It was a good game. It's just, you know, happy I didn't have to play it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. So he did. I thought he threw away the advantage in this game. I didn't see what ended up happening, though. Oh, I'm looking at it right now. Like, there are so much more fun games than this. He brought oh, his bishop like back to C2 to defend the A pawn, and then he could double rooks on the B file. B6, defending the pawn on a dark square. Mm-hmm. So now he wants to bring his bishop to attack C6, maybe? Well, look at that. Guessed it. Yeah, I don't like Black's bishop. I know, it's, to say it's the least. so terrible. <laughs> it's stuck. Like, that's what happens when you just really it's don't want to bad, it, it, That bishop's trapped. Like, it's based, oh. right? I don't oh. know if I like that, though. Now, now you're kind of freeing up the bishop. Yeah, but bishop. he's he's trying to but win the game. But does this work tactically? He's trying to win the game. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what? 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 Does that work? It's a classical what's game. To, wait, what's he trying to do? Of course it works. It's a classical game. He's trying to do something. He's trying to queen his pawns. pawns, He's trying to... Just go for it. Uh, Wait, is that the end of the game? Yeah, Black hung the rook trying to stop a5, a6. Uh, The threat here was for the a-pawn to go all the way. Wow. Wait, so Mentic David won by just sacking the rook for the... I wonder how long White thought before taking it. I bet even mentioned three seconds. Oh yeah, yeah you won. Okay, Actually, sorry, there's a home. there's sort of like a second winning idea as well. Like if the rook goes here to cover this, then you play rook check. If this rook trades, you trade it and queen this pawn. Yeah. And if the king comes up, it blocks off the rook as well. So. Oh, that's so cool. That's Looks so winning. Cool. Wow. What about what about rook rook d8? JB, I don't oh, actually know as much as it sounds rook like I do say. Rook d8 here? That hangs a rook, never mind. Well, it doesn't hang a rook. This thing can block? Yeah, that's true. So, so okay, so if that thing blocks, so... Oh, those pawns are just too powerful. One rook's not going to do anything. Probably this. Uh, and now it's... That bishop, now it's that bishop I mean, there. Can, yeah. can black try to hold this? Rook versus Rook and Bishop up two pawns, even though the pawns are that weak. Like if you can sack one of the Rooks, that was pretty to me. for two pawns. Yeah, I, I think, quite a lot I think each early. of these pawns is going to cost Black one Rook at this point. That's how bad really? it's gotten. Yeah. yeah. I see wait, wait, so you, you can't even sack rook one Rook here? For two wait, Rook. Oh Jesus! Forcing that yeah, no, right. This is dead. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Wow. It's the pawns are are not selling those for less than one are, rook per pawn at this point. Those, those are like the richest <laughs> pawns I've ever seen. Oh, I just man. like I've never seen pawns that like just 
like incredible. They're awesome. <laughs> nice Value. move. So I wonder how long Black spent on this move. My guess is not long. I'm gonna try to look it up. On what? taking the this rook. Way. Yeah. What a, I mean. Well, White's threatening rook takes c6. Yeah, I which think kind I of picks take... Black apart. I think I gotta take that rook and try my luck. I wonder. I wonder how long Mensik thought about uh, thought about that rook sack because it's the coolest rook sack. Like, it's just great. Right. It's like if I take that rook, yeah, I'm probably losing. But if I don't take that rook, I'm definitely losing. <laughs> <laughs> Hard. But so it's like so it's like I might as well get a rook while I'm at it. Oh wow, I was super wrong. Black spent seven and a half minutes. Yeah. On taking. Yeah. Probably how saw that did, it was just losing. How long did White take for their? White to took two minutes to play rook b6. That's impressive. Might have seen it before then, though, and was just double checking. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, he planned it. He had a move before that took four minutes. Take okay. The bishop. Wow, I would definitely calculate some lines before playing this move. The the rook b six. Yeah, very concrete. <laughs> it's so cool! It's so cool. My style like, would be a lot of calculation before playing. Right, it. but you got it. You have to make sure it works. Otherwise, you're gonna two. hate yourself four. after two. Yeah. I mean, that's that's just, I mean, I would say, I would put that up for a bit brilliancy, you know, as far as that, just Rook, rook B6, like, that's, that's just, it's so, it's so cool, like, what it does. Yeah, this is a super impressive game here. <laughs> but also, just sort of the difference between me and players like this, like, I, like, he intuited that move, which I would not... Wait, why can't after uh, C takes B, Rook B3? Mm hmm. And yeah, now you can do probably get two pawns for one yeah, rook. Then just A5. Uh, rook B7. So if A6, A6. you're going to trade your rooks for a pawn and a bishop, right? Yeah. Okay. You can have my bishop, but you're still going to trade me one uh, rook for A7. each pawn. Wait, rook a six? Oh my eight. god, they have a skewer. And then, and then you skewer, yep. <laughs> that's, wow. That's, that's oh, just, the, the king oh. is all... The king being... Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, there's several ways to win once you get this far along. Like, you can also win with just rook a1, getting behind this in advance, powering it up. That would be less fancy, but... Pretty inevitable. I, just, like, I love it. Like, like this is just such a fun position. Yeah. Like it's just it's just fun. And it's not like you can see like it's not like you can like David, would you have been able to see this three moves like before as saying like white looks better? In a classical like, game, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it's like that, that that rook sack is just so cool. I mean when you've got an open file, when you've got an open file next yeah. to this kind of a pawn structure, right, locked mm -hmm. pawns, and you're the person with the space advantage, you can very, very often plunk a rook on a square defended by a knight or a bishop. Super common. It's that happened millions of times. I've never really seen that. I don't know if I can remember seeing this, seeing this like something like this before. So it's like this is definitely a move for me to to put. Right. Under These yeah. are things that people like, with many, thousands. many hundreds and thousands of hours of experience on us know that we don't. <laughs> yeah, but it's yeah. valuable. This one's this one's valuable, I think. Somehow. I mean, sometimes your opponent will have like rooks on b8 and d8 would be more common than where their rooks are. Uh -huh. And in the face of that, you still just plop your rook on b6. <laughs> yeah. 
and you attack the side pawn and that causes the tension to try and force them to make a trade and then you come through with your pawn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. All right. So in nine hours, I'm going to start oh, the stream good. for the Mega Rapid Championships. Oh, yeah. I got to wake up for that. Yeah. I'm I'm working. And before I'm that, I have to make breakfast and lunch. And Yeah. Oh, man. I, I should probably make lunch for myself before I start playing. And then I have to try to finish my work stuff before 11 so I can play in that. Mm -hmm. right. I've got, I, I am actually just working, so I will be viewing, but I cannot... Uh, I cannot participate, unfortunately. Good night, guys. Good night. Yeah, one, of, night one of my students said he wants to play. He, he, yes. He's going to try. That's nice. Awesome. Found you online. Wait, what, what's he rated, do you think, online? What do I think he's rated? Like chess.com? He plays yeah. in the least. I think he's probably 350 or 400. Yes. Oh. He, can wait, he has to go up against Demon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i don't know i bet his rating is on chess.com is even lower than that but i think he's been practicing a lot in the last couple of weeks and he's like like his his lee chess rating has started to climb he started like beating he was like i'm losing to everyone and now he's starting to beat everyone so i think i think he's probably like in his rating so yeah i think he probably could be close to 400 chess.com demon demon versus your student yeah, that'll be exciting. Well, what, what's his, what, what's his uh, ping me with his username if you find out? All right, yeah. I'll, I'll send him. Uh, yeah. So, him anyway, I final announcements for the evening, folks. Um, tomorrow, we have a mega rapid championship all day. Uh, the round start for the first round is 10 0 0 a.m. So, I'll be starting the stream at like 9 30 or what, like the moment I get home from taking the kids to school to give people you know that twitch alert that brings i don't know half of our participants <laughs> and on um, so that's why it says 9 30 and 10 9 30 on the schedule that's when i'll try to get the stream started 10 a.m is when the first game starts it'll last till like 3 p.m ish pacific time it'll be about a five hour tournament maybe five hours and 10 minutes i don't know um if we get 150 participants, I will perform a rap song towards the end. And, um, and on Sunday, on Sunday, we'll do pairings for the first round of the May-June Classical. So registration is open for that. There's a link for that event for those of you who are fans of classical chess. Um, we have 25 entrants so far. And we'll be looking to get another 50 to 100 over the weekend. All right. So those are my announcements. Those are upcoming tournaments. I um, hope everybody is good. And uh, we will go get some sleep. Oh, something's on camera on Twitter. <laughs> like my like shoulder. Surprisingly, he just showed up on Twitch for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> well played, Seth. Oh, this the answer on mind. Wesley. Um, well, Wesley won like a short rapid chess match with Carlson and Fisher Random. It was impressive, but I would think that if they played, you know, 10 classical games, Magnus would come out on top. I don't think my claim was that bold that Carlson would be the best player. Yes. I think a lot of people would agree. I mean, he has a title in an event run by people who didn't even know how to give the right title to the event. So, anyway. <laughs> we can discuss at length another time. Cheers. See you guys 
in nine hours, as JB says. <laughs> Why so serious? 